First of all, no one knows everything except God the Father, okay? I will try to teach you important areas that are clear. Guidelines, framework from the Word of God that does teach us important truths that will help guide us through the last days. And if you are a leader, we'll help you to lead your church, your Bible study, your family, to lead the people victoriously through these last days. So we want to study first our topic. Section number one about the last days, Christ's return will be soon in our generation, but not yet. Many of you have heard the phrase I coined, Ikalong pagdating ni Jesus Cristo ay malapit na pero hindi pa. Okay? And we're going to study scripturally why this will help to give us uh, a, a preparation and a foundation to understand this subject. Number one, Christ's return is soon. It will be in our generation. But Christ's second coming will not be tonight or next week unless he comes for you personally. Okay? <laughs> and Brother Edwin, let's stay healthy. Let's live long lives. Okay? Run a long race. But Jesus said... No man knows the day or the hour of his second coming, not uh, except God the Father. So it would be foolish for us to try to set dates and years for the second coming. But let's turn in Matthew chapter 16 to start. Some of the theologians of the day were talking to Christ. And he explained to them how they were spiritually blind in understanding the time that they lived in. And so in Matthew 16, verse 2, Jesus answered them and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, you say, It, it will be bad weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky or the present weather, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. They could give a good estimate of the coming weather. They could give a natural forecast of what was coming. But Jesus said to these Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders of the nation, that they should know what was the time and season of God so that they could properly lead the people into what God was doing in that generation. They did not understand. There were a few that knew it was the time of the first coming of Christ. There was Simeon. There was Anna. There were those that knew that it was the time for the coming of Christ, that were waiting, that were praying, fasting. But most of the religious leaders did not know that it was time. And so they ignored, they got jealous, they rejected their Messiah instead of receiving him. And we don't want to have any misconceptions that can hinder us. Jesus said to them, they should know the times and seasons. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3.1, that there is a time and a season for everything to be done. And so, if we can gain spiritual discernment from God, we can have wisdom to know, as it says of the tribe of Issachar, to know what, what the people of God should be doing at any certain time. So that we are working with God. If God is going this way, we want to go with God. But if God is going this way, we don't want to go that way. Or we might find ourselves fighting against God. Like when Saul of Tarsus thought he was serving God, imprisoning all of those people that followed that false Messiah, Jesus. He thought he was going God's way. He didn't know he was going the wrong way. So we need to understand that Christ said that the religious leaders should understand the times and seasons. 
we should not foolishly try to find a date or a year for the second coming. But Jesus has given us clear prophetic signs to show us we are in the last days. And the second coming of Jesus is Malapitna Perohindipa. So let's start with the first great sign that the Lord Jesus gave to his church, to the Gentile nations. Number A, the Great Commission must be completed before the second coming of Christ. Let's read Matthew 24, verse 14. As Christ is speaking about the last days, in verse 3, his disciples said, What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Then Jesus started to answer. And he said in verse 14, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So Jesus said, a great sign to tell us when will be the end of the age, the end of the church, is when the church finishes its great commission. We have marching orders. Jesus started out in Matthew 28 saying to the original disciples, all power has been given me in heaven and earth, therefore you go, teach the nations, baptize them, and I will be with you until the end of the age that are in the church age, we have a commission, a holy mission, that the church is to arise as an army to preach the gospel into all the world. And when the church finishes its job, Jesus will come back. Jesus will not come back to a world that has not heard the gospel, to a world that could claim, we didn't know. No, we are to... Offer the gospel of salvation in all the world. And then, Jesus said it will be the end of the age. He will return. So, let's look at our first PowerPoint. If you can put that up, please, the beginning. To the Jews, Jesus gave the sign that Jerusalem would be, again, ruled by the Jews. We'll look at that shortly. But the great prophetic sign he gave to the Gentile foreign nations, to the church is that the Great Commission will be completed. And we can look statistically at what is happening in the religions of the world and see that born-again Christianity is growing faster than any other religion. It's growing twice as fast as Buddhism and Hinduism. And in the born-again Church of Jesus Christ, the group that's growing even much faster than that are the Pentecostal Charismatics that preach the power of the Holy Spirit. But the church is growing around the world, spreading around the world. There are over two billion people that declare they are Christians. They're not all living righteously. They'll not all get to heaven. But the knowledge of the gospel is being spread around the world. And in the last hundred years, Christianity has exploded from just being a European and a North American-based religion to spread through all of the continents of the world. In the last, ten, uh, last few years, 10 years I think, there are 300 million new believers and all but 10 million of them. So 29 million out of 10. 97% of the new believers in Jesus in the last decade are in Asia and in Africa in the what's called the third world nations or the southern nations of the world in the tropics and the south so the church is growing rapidly throughout the world bible translation has also very rapidly increased in the last hundred years. Now, if you can see on this chart, well, if you see the chart there that starts out at a zero, then 500, then 1,000 years, 1,500, 2,000, 
that shows the course of church history over 2,000 years. And the line on the bottom is very small. In the year 1000, there were still only about 23 languages in the world that had the Bible translated. By the year 1500, there were only about 53 nations of the world that had the Bible translated. But starting in the 1800s, there's an explosion. You see the chart rapidly going up. Now there are thousands of languages that have the Word of God. It's estimated that 87% of the world's population can read the Bible in their own home mother tongue. Okay? Back 800 years ago, it was maybe 30 or 40 percent of the world could read the Bible in their mother tongue. But the Bible is rapidly being translated into every language of the world. And one center for Asia is down in the Green Hills area, down at Horseshoe Village, if any of you have ever visited the SIL headquarters there, where they are t helping to translate the Word of God throughout many languages uh, here in Asia. And so the Philippines is a center of Bible translation here for Asia, the largest continent of the world. Now, Christian radio broadcasting has also been very important to help spread the Word of God. It's estimated that now 91% of the world's population can hear the gospel preached in their own language on radio broadcasts. Only 9% still to be reached that can hear the gospel everywhere around the world. I was in Myanmar a number of years ago when the country was much more strongly communistic and I was eating at a restaurant, and there was a big billboard sign outside the restaurant because the restaurant I ate in had a lot of foreigners that came and ate there. So the government put up this big billboard, and the billboard said, the will of the people. But the people didn't make this big billboard. It was the government, the communist government, the dictators. But they said, the will of the people, and they said no to foreign propaganda. No to foreign this and that. It was all in English, so it wasn't for the Myanmar people. It was for the foreigners that ate at that restaurant to be told by the government, don't propagandize our people. And one was no to religious teachings. Another one, no to foreign radio broadcasts. And my Myanmar pastor host, he said, the radio broadcasts that the government's met at, that's FEBC over in Manila. They're broadcasting in a lot of our languages here in Myanmar. And many people are turning to Christ because they're hearing the gospel in their own language. So radio broadcasts, which are also very effective in spreading the word of God, the Philippines has been a center of spreading the word of God through radio broadcast and through the Far East Broadcasting Corporation up in Valenzuela. There's also gospel TV, satellites, and in a number of nations in the Middle East, there is revival, and Christians are, uh, people are turning to Christ. Muslims are secretly turning to Christ by hundreds of thousands in the nation of Iran. They have their secret police always looking at the rooftops in the big cities for satellite antennas because they don't want people to be able to get the international TV broadcasts because so many people are listening to the gospel programs by satellite and are turning to Christ. And they've written in, thousands of them have written in or, or sent secret messages to the international Christian groups and they said, when we turn on our TV broadcasts, our religion tells us that we should hate everyone and that we should die for God. But when we turn on your Christian broadcasts, we hear about a God of love, that we should love one another, and that we shouldn't die for our God, but we should live for God and serve the people. And they said, the difference between that hatred and dying and your religion of love, of forgiveness, of serving, is making a great impact through radio broadcasts, yes, 
through TV, through internet, through a lot of modern communications. Now also, the southern nations of the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, are quickly multiplying more missionaries to spread around the world. The traditional European and, um, and North American countries have not sent out more missionaries for over 70 years, sometimes a little less. But the number of international missionaries is skyrocketing. The Koreans sending out 30,000. Chinese aiming to send out 50,000. In the Philippines, there's the aim of mission groups to send out 10,000 trained overseas workers that are also skilled and committed to be missionaries spreading the gospel. And so when the nations of the world all arise to step forward as the army of God to complete the great commission, ang ikalawang pagdating ni Jesus Cristo ay malapit na. Okay? And so we want to understand that. And missiologists or uh, church statisticians, people that scientifically analyze the growth of the church in different countries, they have proclaimed a few years ago that in 15 years, that would be 2028 now, the church can complete the Great Commission if the church is fully dedicated to use its resources to spread the gospel. We can get the job done soon. Now, will the church spread the gospel that quickly? Well, unfortunately, in many nations, the Christians spend more money on cat food or dog food or lipstick than they do on spreading the gospel to other nations. And there's nothing wrong. Feed your cat. Ladies, if you like lipstick, that's fine too. Okay, that's not wrong. But what are our priorities is what we have to understand. So the church, if it's fully dedicated, can quickly complete the Great Commission. But it might take longer. But it is becoming finished. The church is getting ready to complete the Great Commission. Does that excite you? Because our Lord said that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. And then the end of the age will come. And so we want to praise the Lord that we have a great sign, a great prophecy of Jesus given to the church. That we have a job to do and praise God we are living in the days when we are starting to finish that job. That doesn't mean that every one of us will go, but every one of us can pray, and every one of us can trust God to even give a little, as well as pray a lot. And if you pray, and if you give, you might end up going also. Short-term missions, going to a needy country to live, to work, to share the gospel. Christ's return will be soon because the church is completing its job. Now, in our notes, the second great reason for us knowing that the second coming of Christ is close is that the generation that saw the Jews again rule over Jerusalem, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, is the last generation. Let's turn in Luke chapter 21. Starting in Jesus talking about the troubles that would come upon the land. Let's start in Luke 21 in verse 5. As some of the disciples spoke about the great temple in Jerusalem, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and, and beautiful things donated, Jesus said, The things you see, well, the days will come when there will be not one stone left upon another. The temple will be thrown down. And so, the disciples came, verse 7, and said, Teacher, when will these things be? What will be the sign these things will take place? What was the question here? The question here is, when will the temple in Jerusalem be destroyed? 
that's different than what the disciples asked in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, they said, Lord, what will be the end, the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So the main message of the prophetic chapter, Matthew 24, is about the end of the church. But here, Jesus said, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be torn down, not one stone left on another. And his disciples said, Lord, when will this happen? And so Jesus gives a prophecy of the future, but it starts out mainly talking about the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And so, in verse 20, Jesus said, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, no, its destruction is near. Verse 21, Let those in Judea flee to the mountains. And then, verse 24, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away as captives into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Jerusalem will be trampled down or ruled over by Gentile nations. Okay? Until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Now, the Apostle Paul talked about how the church age is the age of the Gentiles. Back before Christ's first coming, God was working through the Jewish people. That was called the age of the Jews. But after the cross, the message of God was primarily sent to all of the foreign Gentile nations around the world. At the second coming of Christ, Jesus is coming back for his church, mostly Gentile, and he's coming back for the Jews. And Jews and Gentiles will live together, all the redeemed, in, after Jesus' second coming, in the millennial thousand-year kingdom of God. But before the cross, it was the age of the Jews for 1,500 years. From the first to second coming of Christ, it is the age of the Gentiles. When Jesus was ministering to the Israelites, a Gentile woman, a Syrophoenician woman came up and said, Lord, help my daughter, she's demon-possessed. And Jesus said, I am only now sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And she said, but Lord, even, you know, even the dogs will appreciate the crumbs. And, and so Jesus gave her her answer, although it was not yet the time for the Gentile foreign nations. In the Gospel of John, near the end of Jesus' ministry, it says, and I think it's, uh, John teacher, is it John 11 or 12? The corn of wheat fall to the ground, I think that's 12. Uh, then uh, be right before that, it says that Greeks first came to seek the Lord Jesus. The first time it's recorded, a group of foreigners came to see Jesus. And they told it to Jesus. And when they told Jesus, foreigners are now starting to seek for you, Jesus didn't say, good, the gospel is for everyone. What did he say? He said, it's time now that I am the grain of wheat planted in the ground. I will die for a harvest to come. Jesus had to die so that then the gospel could be given to the foreign Gentile nations. And when the Gentiles started to come and seek Jesus, he knew the end of his ministry was at hand. It was time now to die and give the salvation through the cross to the Gentiles. But when Jerusalem is no longer ruled over by the Gentiles, Jesus said, this generation that sees this happen will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. So we need to understand that Jesus gave a prophetic key that talked about the last generation. Okay? When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know its destruction is near. They'll fall by the edge of the sword. And Jerusalem will be ruled over by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles or the church age. 
the preaching of the gospel to all the foreigners until that is becoming completed. And when the gospel is being spread into all the world and the Jews are reformed as a nation and regain their capital, Jerusalem, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things are fulfilled. Now, Christ's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem historically was fulfilled in 70 AD, about 40 years after his death, when the Roman army under General Titus destroyed Jerusalem. The General Titus had given the commandment not to destroy the beautiful temple of God, but the angry Roman soldiers, when they came in, burned down the city, burned the temple, and the temple burned so heavily that the gold-plated uh, covering over the temple melted into the cracks of the stones. And then the Romans had to tear every stone off of the temple to go down and get the melted gold that they were stealing. And so they destroyed not one stone left upon another. That's a lot of hard work for a huge temple. But all of the melted gold gave great motivation to the Roman armies to completely destroy the temple, which Jesus had prophesied of. And from that time when Jerusalem was destroyed, then Jerusalem was ruled over by Gentile or foreign nations for almost 1900 years from 70 A.D. to 1948. The first group of foreigners that ruled over them from 70 A.D. to 324, more than two and a half centuries, were the Romans. And then as the Roman Empire was splitting up its eastern part, the Byzantine Empire ruled over Jerusalem for another 300 years. Then after that, the Muslim invasions ruled over Jerusalem for about 400 years. All foreigners, not Jews. After that, the European Crusaders came in and conquered Palestine and Jerusalem and ruled there for a season. After them, the Muslims came and conquered again. Three different Muslim empires, the Ayyubid, the Mamluk, and the Ottomans, or the Turks, into recent history. At the end of World War I, the Turks, the Ottomans, lost their empire, and the British started to rule over Jerusalem and Israel. But the British were foreign Gentiles also. It was only when the British withdrew that in our modern times, Israel became a nation in 1948. But even then, the Jews only ruled over one of the four quarters of Jerusalem. The other three quarters were still ruled by Gentiles, by Jordan. The Jews ruled over the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, but the Armenian quarter, the Arab quarter, and what's the other quarter? The Christian quarter. They were all ruled over by the nation of Jordan until the Sixth Day War. Okay? Up until that time, Israel only ruled over the small part over on the left side in the gray shaded, shaded area of that map. Okay? But by the time of the Sixth Day War in 1967, the Jewish soldiers conquered all of Jerusalem. And the prophecy of Jesus was fulfilled that the Jerusalem will be ruled over by Gentiles, foreign armies, until when? Until the times of the Gentiles, the age of the Gentiles, the time when the gospel is being preached to the foreign nations, until that time is becoming completed. And then Jesus said that that generation, the times of the Gentiles, the church age, is drawing to a close because foreigners no longer rule over Jerusalem. After 1,900 years of many foreign empires and foreign nations ruling Jerusalem, now Jerusalem is all ruled by the Jews. Now, do you know one of the biggest, I think the biggest, 
uh, point of contention. The biggest argument in all of the world politically is centered on Jerusalem and Israel. And the nations of the world are pressuring the Jews to divide the land and no longer rule all of Jerusalem. Give some to the Arabs. Give some back to the Palestinians. Jesus said, when Jerusalem is ruled by the Jews, the church age is drawing to a close. And so Satan does not want the Jews to rule over Jerusalem because the Jews ruling over Jerusalem is a sign that the king of Jerusalem will come soon. And the king of Jerusalem is not a Palestinian. He's a Jew <laughs> from natural birth. And his name is Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Or Yeshua, if we want to get more technically correct, okay? <laughs> but this re, uh, regathering of Jerusalem, again being ruled by the Jews, is a sign to the Jews that the Messiah is coming soon. For the Gentile nations, a sign that the Messiah is coming soon is that the gospel is being preached around all the world. But these are the two great signs Jesus gave. He said, this generation, what? That sees Jerusalem no longer ruled over by foreign powers. That sees Israel blooming again. This nation, or this generation, excuse me, will not pass away, verse 32, Luke 21. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all things take place. Now, 25 times Jesus spoke using this word generation. And he always was referring to a generation of people. Like he said, uh, the people that lived in Sodom and Gomorrah will rise up against this generation and condemn them because you have the preaching of the gospel which is much greater than what they had. But he was rebuking the people of his day, that present generation. In the book of Matthew, it says the generations of Jesus Christ from, uh, from Abraham to David, it lists 14, it says 14 generations from Abraham and 14 generations is talking about the lifespan of an average person. And how long is an average generation? Well, scientists now tell us it's something like 72.5 years. I, I haven't heard recently. I'm sure it's changed. Uh, and in different nations, it's a little more. Japan has the longest lifespan. But the average lifespan of a person is about 70 years, or if they're strong, it can be 80 some people will beat the odds, you know, take your vitamins, walk, exercise every day. But that's an average lifespan. And if you take 70 or 80 years and add it to 1967, when Jerusalem was again ruled by the Jews, you have that this generation will not all die. The generation that saw Jerusalem again ruled by the Jews uh, will still, some will still be around by 2037, even 2047. They won't all die before Jesus will come again. Now, when could the church complete the Great Commission? Maybe by 2028 or 2030 or 2035, 2040 if we're slower. When will Jesus come back? before the last generation dies? Well, there will still be some alive after 2047, but the basic truth is the generation that has been born and has lived after 1967, Jesus said, this generation will not all pass away, will not all die until they see these things come to pass. And there will be the second coming of Christ. Now I would like to ask any of you that are were born in 1967 or later. 
born in 1970, 72, 75. Uh, if you'll stand up, please. I'm among the seaters, okay? I'm among the sitting. If you were born from 1967 or later, stand up, okay? Now, according to the words of Jesus, I would like to commend to everyone here, the brothers and sisters that are standing, you are the Joshua generation. You will not all die before the prophecy of Jesus' second coming will be completed, okay? You may be seated. And for the rest of us, get your exercise, okay? Stay healthy. Be ready for the long run. I want, if God is so gracious, I want to be here to see the final fireworks, okay? Because the end is better than the beginning, okay? God always wraps things up the best at the end. So I want to be around by God's grace. And remember also, with the Joshua generation, it was led by Joshua and Caleb. And how old were they? They were 80 years plus when they led, led the younger uh, Joshua army, okay? So you can be 80 years plus and you can still be a leader for the Joshua generation. Okay, so everyone sitting will say? Amen. All of us that couldn't stand, okay. But Jesus gave two great prophecies to the Jews when Jerusalem is ruled again by the Jews, it's time for the Jews to arise. The, they are preparing for their place in the kingdom of God when the Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem. And for the Gentiles, the rest of the nations, the great sign that, the, that Jesus is coming soon is that all of the world will have heard the message. Everyone will have an opportunity to be saved before Christ returns. He came the first time as a savior, but he's coming the second time as a judge and a king. And before the judge of the whole earth returns, everyone needs to have an opportunity to hear the gospel and to turn to Christ. So our job isn't done yet. Don't let someone else do it, brothers and sisters. You pray, you give, maybe you will go for the gospel and spread it. Spread it to your neighbor before you worry about, you know, Mongolia or Laos. <laughs> Tell your neighbor about Jesus. And if you start first in your own Jerusalem, your own local area, out into the provinces, the day may come when you will go to the nations with the message of salvation. Amen? Amen? Okay. So these are the two great signs that Jesus gave that tell us the second coming is near, but not yet. Okay. Now we have another group of prophetic symbols in the Old Testament that teach us that the church age, the age of the Gentiles, between the first and second coming, will be approximately 2,000 years from the death of Christ when the church began until his second coming. Now, number C in your notes. Okay, number, part number one, talking about the brazen laver of Solomon's temple. P, uh, Paul taught us in uh, Corinthians 316 first Corinthians that we are the temple of God Peter said in first Peter 2 5 that we are being built up together as living stones to be made a holy temple for the Lord now it is the Christians we are being built up to be a spiritual temple of God but if we want to know what kind of a temple it will be when our Christians are all joined together we need to look back at Solomon's temple because that Old Testament temple was prophetic of the New Testament temple, the church. Okay? So look at Solomon's temple. It was to be glorious, famous throughout the world. That is what Jesus' New Testament temple, the body of Christ, is to be glorious and famous throughout the world. Now, most we can't 
We don't have time to study all of the wonderful truths in Solomon's temple. We just want to look at one little part, the big brass bowl that was in the outer court outside of the building. Okay, see, there's the building, and it's surrounded by a large outer court. In the outer court, there's the brass bowl held up by the brass figures of the oxen. So here's a bigger picture of it. And you can see water spouting out from that big brass, big brass bowl. And there's priests down at the pool under it, collecting the water, washing their clothes. The big, big brass bowl was to uh, cleanse the priests. They washed themselves because they had a pretty uh, difficult job out in the outer court. They had to chop up cow after cow after cow after goat after goat lamb after lamb kill them chop them up separate them burn them throw them on you know the burning fire on the on the altar and it was hot and it was sweaty and it was bloody and they had to wash themselves to be a holy priesthood to serve god at the temple now this all has prophetic meaning for us the old testament priests now speak to us in the New Testament about every born-again Christian. Every Christian is a priest unto God. He has made us a kingdom of priests to our God, Revelation chapter 1. We are all to offer the sacrifices of praise. Our own body is to be a living sacrifice, holy to the Lord, declaring His glory. And so we are the priests, and the water that is to cleanse the priests of the Lord today, or the born-again Christians, the water that cleanses us is not made out of H2O. It's not natural water. Indeed, too big. It is the Word of God. Because in Ephesians chapter 5, we are given a spiritual interpretation for a spiritual water, where Paul writes, and he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse the church by the washing of water by the word that he might present a glorious church. What washes the Christians that we can become a glorious church? It's not natural water. Pastor Edwin doesn't have a big sink out at the front door. We all need to wash our hands before we come to church. No, but we should make sure before we come to church we are all washed by the water of God's Word. We're living God's Word. We are clean by the Word of God living and working in our lives. So, the spiritual priests now, that's us, are cleansed to serve God in His temple and in the body of Christ. We're cleansed by the Word of God. And this big brass bowl was carried by 12 brass oxen, or Paran Carabao for the Philippines, okay? These 12 oxen, beasts of burden, they were, they were made of brass. They weren't real creatures, but they were put, they were made in the form of the statues of oxen because oxen have, again, a prophetic significance in the scriptures. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 and in Timothy talked about how we are, that you should not muzzle the ox. That's quoted from, I think, Deuteronomy. And he said, in the Old Testament, the animals that made a harvest, make sure you feed them. And Paul said, but that was written for us. And it means feed your pastors. Now it is the church workers and pastors that bring forth a harvest. We are to work diligently and hard like an oxen to bring forth a spiritual harvest. But Paul paralleled the Old Testament oxen, the servants for a harvest, with the New Testament ministers who work hard for a spiritual harvest. And so, who are the ones that carry the water of the Word of God? Today, it's the pastors, the cell group leaders, the Bible teachers, those serving in ministry that are carrying the water of God just as those oxen 
carry this huge bowl of water on their backs in Solomon's temple. Now it also says there were 12 of these oxen, three facing to each of the four directions, north, west, south, and east. And 12 in the Bible is a number symbolic of government. How many tribes in the Old Testament? How many apostles in the early church? Twelve. How many hours in the day and night? How many notes from A, A sharp, B, C, C sharp, D, A, uh, all the way back up to the next octave? How many notes? There's twelve. How many months in a year? Twelve. God has made twelve a number of government. It governs our year. It governs our day. It governs our music. It governs the Old Testament people of God, the New Testament people of God. So when twelve oxen carried this water, speaking of the servants of the Lord carrying the word of God, it's all of the servants of God. Everyone called to Christian leadership and ministry. That is to carry the word. But it started primarily, of course, in Jerusalem with the twelve apostles. And it was from Jerusalem that Jesus said to them, All power in heaven and earth has been given me. Go into all the world. First Jerusalem, then Judea and Samaria, then you know, to the outermost parts of the world. It started that Jesus pointed... The Bible teachers, the evangelist missionaries, he pointed them to the four corners of the world from Jerusalem. And where was the temple of Solomon? It was in Jerusalem. And these four, these twelve oxen that from Jerusalem, carrying this water of cleansing, looked out through the world. This was also prophetic of the first twelve apostles that starting from Jerusalem went to the north, to the west, to the south, to the east, starting to spread the gospel. As God was building the New Testament temple, which is not made of stones, it's made out of living stones, you and I. So all of the servants of the Lord starting in Jerusalem, going throughout the world, are to carry, not water, but the washing of the water by the word of God into all the world. Starting with Pentecost, after the death of Christ, spreading through the world. But when we study church history, or even secular history, we find that the first direction the multiplying of the gospel flourished was to the north of Jerusalem. So here we have on a world map, if you want to look at this one, we have Jerusalem, right, kind of in the center between Europe, Asia, and Africa, and directly north of Jerusalem, first big group out of Judea was Samaria. And you read in the book of Acts, after the Jews around Jerusalem and Judea were getting evangelized. Then there was revival in Samaria, just north. After Samaria, the next great revival recorded in uh, chapter 11 and 12 was there was revival in Antioch. Antioch was just about another thousand kilometers north, directly north of Jerusalem. And as the gospel kept spreading... There were times when Paul wanted to go into Asia Minor, Bithynia, and here and there in Acts 16, the Spirit of God did not permit him to go here or there or there. And they were at a seacoast, port city, and they couldn't go this way or that way or that way. The other way was water. So what do they do? They prayed. Paul had a vision, a dream. And it said, men from across the ocean from Macedonia, from Europe, said, come over and help us. And Paul was directed by the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel over to Europe because 
The Middle East is part of Asia. The gospel started in the Middle East. That's in Asia, but then it went north from Jerusalem and then it jumped over to Greece and spread through the Roman Empire and the first continent of the world where every nation said they had become Christian was the continent of Europe. By 1100 AD, every single nation in Europe said they were Christian. That doesn't mean they were all born again. No, lots of corrupt people, but the society was transformed. The gospel had spread. Everyone could hear the gospel. What happened? The oxen carrying the word of God, they went, first of all, northward. Now, please, in your Bible, let's turn in 1 Kings 7, 26 where it gives us the description of the building of Solomon's temple. 1 Kings 7. Okay, starting in verse 23, it says, Solomon made the sea of cast bronze completely round, uh, and then in verse 25, it stood on 12 oxen. So are you there? 1 Kings 7, verse 25. This big brass bull stood on 12 oxen. Three of the oxen looked to the north. Three looked to the west. Three looked to the south. And three looked to the east. Now the order in which this was given was not a normal order. It wasn't clockwise. It wasn't counterclockwise. No, it was a somewhat unusual order. The first place was north. Okay. But the order in which these oxen faced out, ready to take the water in their direction, north, take the water west, then take the water south, that was prophetic of how the word of God is being spread throughout the world during the church age, during world history from the first to second coming of Christ. First, the gospel went north, and then... After Europe became Christianized, there was war between the Europeans and the Muslims, and a man named Christopher Columbus uh, was afraid that the Muslims might overrun Europe. They were attacking and destroying, and uh, he said that as a young man, God spoke to him in a vision and said, I will give you the keys to unlock the oceans of the world. He became a great student of Bible prophecy, Christopher Columbus. He wrote one book in his lifetime. The title, A Book of Bible Prophecy. And in the book, he talks about various Bible prophecies. He wrote it near the end of his life, after he found the Americas, after many nations over in uh, you know, the Caribbean, Central, North America uh, were starting to hear the message about Jesus Christ. He said, for example, that it's clear the second coming of Christ is drawing nearer because the gospel is being preached in so many new nations. And then he quoted Matthew 24, 14. The gospel will be preached in all the world, then the end will come. So he declared in his writings to Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, that it was not his knowledge of mathematics or maps that made his discovery of the new lands. He said it was by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as God spoke to him from the Bible. And uh, he wrote a whole book about it. I don't have time to tell you today, okay? We've got to put world history into about five minutes, okay? But he, he was a man that for through much of his life, was very close to God. And he opened the way that from Jerusalem, from that area of the world, to the west, to the Americas, the gospel spread. So the next great area of the world that was Christianized after Europe were the Americas. From Jerusalem, go west, across the Mediterranean, across the Atlantic, you'll find the Americas. But then the third direction, the oxen looked as they were carrying this water of cleansing, was they were to look south. And again, if you look directly south of Jerusalem, you will very quickly find yourself 
in Africa. And history says that after Europe first became Christianized, after the Americas became Christianized, the next area of the world to become Christianized was Africa. And just in the last 10 years, statisticians have said that now most of Africa claim to be Christians. Yes, North Africa is still a stronghold of Islam, but most of Africa is turning to Christ. First Europe, then the Americas, and then Africa. But what was the last direction that the oxen were to look and get ready to travel carrying the word, the water of the word? It was to the east. That's the Orient or Asia. And history again records that in modern times, the last area of the world, the last continent to be majorly evangelized is Asia. Because most of Europe say they're Christians, although it's a pretty uh, lukewarm and dead Christianity. Most of the Americas say they're Christians and definitely Christianized. Most of Africa are now saying they are Christians, although it's, they're not all born again. But in Asia, 50 years ago, very few people said they were Christians. In the nation of Nepal, 50 years ago, there was an estimated 50 Christians. Now, there's 500,000. In China, they thought the church was gone under Mao Zedong back in the early 1950s. Now, there are more born-again Christians in China than there are members of the Communist Party. There's more Christians in China than communists. And that's why they're very nervous. In the last year, they've torn the crosses off of over 1,800 churches just in one area of China. They're bulldozing church buildings. They're afraid of the church because the church is growing bigger than the communist movement of China. Now, they can look at history. Rome persecuted the Christians, but it, the Christians grew and grew until finally the Roman Empire became Christianized. Well, the communist rulers of China don't want China to become Christianized because they're out of a job and they'll be investigated as for why all of their aunts and mothers and uncles are all billionaires. Okay, the top leaders of power have made their relatives very, very wealthy. It's well documented. It's common in nations, right? However, the church is growing rapidly in China. The church is growing rapidly in Vietnam, in India. I was in the area of India where I was preaching for several hundred pastors and they said, 15 years ago, we didn't have any Christians here in this area of Rajasthan. That's western central India. And I said, well, how come there's hundreds of pastors here now? How come you've got so many churches? And they said, well, an evangelist came. He preached the gospel. Twelve tribal people got saved. And they couldn't read, but before the evangelist left, he told them, well, you can't, I can't give you Bibles, you can't read them, but you pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So these 12 new Christians, without a Bible, without a pastor or a Bible teacher, they prayed for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The power of God started to fall. They prayed day after day for the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were filled with His Spirit, began to speak in tongues. They kept praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. The power of God arose and people were healed and demons were cast out. They kept praying for the Holy Spirit to come. They started raising the dead and they kept praying for the Holy Spirit to come. We might have said, he's already here. We don't need more. Okay? <laughs> but they kept pressing in until a great revival swept through that area. And I was introduced to three pastors. And they said, now, this pastor's got about 500 in his church. This one about 1,000. This one has about 1,500 members. But what's, you know, all the churches are big. But they said, but these three are unique because they were not serving God when they were younger. And each of these three died. And it was when the Christians prayed and raised them from the dead that they dedicated their life to serve Jesus. Now, if you aren't a Christian worker, 
right now, you don't have to die, okay, to dedicate your life to serve the Lord. <laughs> but that's what happened to these three. And a great revival swept through that area of India. And Christianity is growing very quickly around Asia. There were 10,000 evangelical churches in the Philippines about 30 years ago. Now, there's, I think, over 60,000 multiply greatly through the Word of God. And so, Asia is the last area of the world that's becoming evangelized. It was the last direction that the oxen carrying the water, speaking of the Word of God, were to face and to travel towards. And my wife once had a a Christian from another Asian nation asked her at a Bible study, well, why did God wait so long to bring the gospel to Asia? Asia has 60% of the world's population. There are more people in Asia than combining Africa, Europe, North America, Australia, and South America combined. More in only Asia. So why did God wait so long? Well, many times in the scriptures we read, how the end of something is better than the beginning. We read in John 2 about the wedding at Cana. It was said about Jesus' works, you have kept the best for the last. And just as in a musical presentation, you want at the end of the musical presentation, you want the finale to be the greatest, to be the best, to be the highest. La, 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 la. And, you know, go, oh, you know, the best, save the best for the end. Okay? The boxer wants to save the knockout punch for the end. So the best will happen at the end. Jesus has waited for the gospel to be spreading through the most populated continent of the world because he's going to declare his power and glory in the greatest way through Asia in these last days. Europe, there will be many say, but they had their day. The Americas, sad to say for my home country, it's backsliding. Africa is still largely going forward, but the cutting edge, the place that God is working the greatest in these last days is Asia. So people ask my wife and I, well, what, do you want to go retire in America? We say, are you crazy? This is where the action is. You know, it, it's, you know, it's more fun in the Philippines. <laughs> and so we want to be where God is moving so we can be in the middle of what God is doing in these last days. Now, it also said that this brass bowl was filled with 2,000 baths. A bath was a measurement of water about the same as an oil barrel today. If you're all remembering oil barrels. It had about 2,000 barrels, or they called it baths of water, filling this big bowl. That number 2,000 is prophetic of the amount of water, not 2,000 liters, not 2,000 barrels, but 2,000 years of the preaching, the spreading of the Word of God to Europe, to the Americas, to Africa, throughout Asia. And then when the gospel has been preached in all the world, then the end will come. How long? About 2,000 years as prophetically symbolized by the 2,000 years of, or the 2,000 baths, excuse me, of Solomon's big brass bull. Now that's not the only time in the Old Testament where 2,000 is symbolic of the approximate length of the church. We don't have time to study it all today, but I have it in your notes. We have number two, the seven days of creation. In Genesis 1, there were six days that God worked. On the seventh day, he rested. And then we can read that Peter said, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. People who have studied the Bible chronology, uh, one man, a bishop, a British bishop named Usher, he tried to get chronology and said, Adam was born about 4,000 B.C. And then you go forward that there were about 2,000 years until the coming of 
Abraham. Then there were about 2,000 years till the first coming of Christ. That's 4,000 years. There will be about 2,000 years to complete six years of God at work, or six days of God at work, or 6,000 years a day is like 1,000 years with the Lord. Six days or 6,000 years of work. And then after about 2,000 years from Christ's coming, it will be the end of the church age. And the Bible clearly tells us the next season or age in God's program for the human race after the second coming will be a 1,000 year reign of Christ upon the earth. So 6,000 years of working and then after the second coming of Christ it will be a 1,000 year kingdom of peace of prosperity when the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's going to be a glorious day. Or a day with the Lord is a thousand years when Jesus returns. Now also, the topology of Moses' tabernacle. Well, if you really want to understand this, ask Pastor Edwin, okay? Because we don't have time now and he teaches Moses' tabernacle very well. But it's, we find symbolized in the numbers of Moses' tabernacle that the outer court has 1,500 square meters of cloth on the outer wall. And then, so, and it was 1,500 years from Moses starting Moses' tabernacle in the age of the Jews until Christ's first coming. Then the dimensions of the holy place, which speaks of now the church age that had 2,000 cubic meters enclosed in its space. And that speaks of 2,000 years of church history. Then the Holy of Holies was 10 by 10 by 10. Okay? You multiply that all, you end up getting 1,000 cubic uh, cubits of measurement. And it speaks of Again, the millennium, the, when we will be closest to God. Now, we don't have uh, time to teach that all, okay? But a thousand years in the Holy of Holies, a thousand cubits, two thousand cubits in the holy place, speaking of the church, fifteen hundred in the outer court, speaking of the earlier age of the Jews. And I'm sorry, this is very fast. If it's confusing, then just turn your brain, put it, put it on the shelf, okay, and ask Pastor Edwin to come teach you sometime, okay? <laughs> sorry about that, brother. Okay, number four, the ark crossing the Jordan. Remember when Joshua was getting ready to start to conquer the promised land, God directed him that first they were to have the priests carry the ark of God, the gold box, symbolizing God with his people. And they were to go 2,000 cubits ahead of Joshua's army. Let's turn in the book of Joshua to see this very quickly. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3. They commanded the people, when you see the ark of the Lord and the priests bearing it, you shall go after them. Verse 4, but there will be a gap, a space between you and the ark, about 2,000 cubits. Do not come near it. They were to go 2,000 cubits behind the ark, the gold box. And so, as they went on, it says in verse 13, it came to pass, as soon as the feet of the priests who bore the ark of the Lord stepped into the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. Okay? So then we get the fulfillment of that in verse 14. When all the people set out and the priests carrying the ark, verse 15, those who carried the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who carried the ark stepped into the edge of the water, verse 16, the waters that came down the Jordan River from upstream stopped. They stood still. And they rose up in a heap very far away, up at Adam, a city beside Zarathon. So all the waters that went down to the Dead Sea were cut off. Now this has prophetic symbolism. 
And if you want to fully understand that, you got to come to Joshua class or, or uh, download my book on Joshua from the internet. It's free, and you can get this fully explained. When Joshua crossed the Jordan, that was a symbol of the church in the New Testament going in. The Jews conquered an Old Testament kingdom. We are to enter in to bring revival and conquer the world with the knowledge of the gospel. When will there be revival? When will we have victory? Well, it was 2,000 years after the ark went into the Jordan. What does the Jordan symbolize? The Jordan is a river that goes down to the deepest place on the face of planet Earth. The Jordan River goes below sea level because, you see, it's a deep valley not connected to the Mediterranean. So the river goes down to a place that is over 1,200 feet below sea level of Manila Bay or Mediterranean or the Atlantic. Those are all pareho ang mga dagat. But the Dead Sea is much lower, the lowest place in the world. And the waters of the Jordan went down, down, down to the Dead Sea because it's so polluted with salts that any fish that's stupid enough to go down to the Dead Sea <laughs> is going to be bottoms up dead. It's the sea full of death. And it typifies spiritually the course of man going down, down, down until we will all die. It's, Jesus was declared that he will die on a cross. Where? At the Jordan River. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it was when Elijah crossed the Jordan that he left this earth and went to heaven. It's a symbol of death. So if uh, you like old uh, country and western gospel songs, you'll hear some of them every now and then. Oh, when I cross that Jordan and I see Jesus. You know, have you ever heard those old songs? Crossing the Jordan is, is recognized worldwide by the church as symbolism of death. Okay. Well, before Joshua's troops got there, the ark went first. And that's good. Because if Joshua's troops marched into the Jordan, it said the Jordan River was at flood peak. It overflowed all its banks. It would have been maybe a, a, a half a kilometer wide. And all of Joshua's army would have drowned carrying their swords trying to get across the river. I'm sure the Canaanites on the other side did not leave them boats, right? Here, you know, 50 pesos, you can come on over and conquer us. No, they did not leave boats for Joshua's army. How could they cross that big raging river at flood time? First, the ark of God, a symbol of God with his people. Tabernacle of Moses, teacher, a symbol of the presence of God, Jesus Christ. When that ark went into the Jordan, went into death, it cut off the waters that led to death. And where did it cut them off? What did we read in verse 16? The waters were cut off and rose up in a big heap far away up at Adam. Way up north, there was a place at the river Jordan called Adam. And that's where the water was cut off when God stepped into the river of death. Now, the Bible tells us that we have all inherited a sinful nature that leads us to death from Adam. From Adam flows a spiritual river of death for every person. But when Jesus stepped into the Jordan, even prophetically, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when Jesus died on the cross, he cut off the waters of death that come from Adam. Okay, so I hope you can understand this. If not, it's, we're going a little fast. Sorry, we have to. You can read my Joshua book or there's lots of other good material on it. Pastor Bailey's Journey of Israel, other books. But 
it says that the ark went 2,000 cubits ahead, symbolizing Jesus will go 2,000 years ahead of when his people will have the victory and cross through, the, through death, through the crucified life, into conquering the kingdom of God. We will have full revival. We will be living in the kingdom of God. We will spiritually cross through death, not physically die, but will embrace the work of of the Lamb of God. We will survive the death of Jordan. We will go on into conquering. How come? Because Jesus went 2,000 cubits ahead of us or 2,000 years ahead. So Joshua's army going in 2,000 cubits behind the Ark of God and the last... 2,000 years from Christ's death to his second coming, two last days before the six days of creation are done in world history, the 2,000 baths of water, this 2,000 all speaks of about 2,000 years from the beginning of the church, that was the death of Jesus, until the church will be completed. Now Joshua was told, go about 2,000 cubits behind. It doesn't say exact. And we don't even absolutely know the exact year of Christ's death. Different historians and theologians will argue it could be as early as 29 AD, might be as late as 32 AD. But right in that area, between 29 years AD and 32, Jesus died. And when he died for the sin of the world, then 50 days later, the church began with the power of Pentecost. The church began to spread. So the church began at the cross about the year 30 AD. And 2,000 cubits later, from when Jesus died, the church will triumphantly cross their own Jordan. After 2,000 baths, of spreading the word of God throughout the world. The oxen will have completed their job to carry the water of God's cleansing from the north to the west, to the south, to the east, to the four corners of the world. So 2,000 speaks of the approximate length of the church. And if that's about 30 AD, we don't know exact. 29 AD, 32. That means the 2,000 years will be up about the year 2030. 2032? Somewhere around there. Now, the church could complete the Great Commission as early as 2028. If we're lazy, which is common for Christians, it might be 2030, 2040. The generation that saw Jerusalem ruled again by the Jews starting in 1967. If they're dying at 70, that's 2037. If they're 80 years old, that's 2047. But they won't all die before Jesus comes back. 2,000 years shows us the second coming is about 2030. The preaching of the gospel shows us it can be done in 15, 20, 25 years. The Jews ruling Jerusalem, those people will all die within 30 or 40 years. Before that time, in the next five, probably not five, 10, 20, 25 years, Jesus is coming again. He is not coming yet, and we will study reasons for that in these two days of class, things that must yet take place in world history, but he will come again, but we are in the last generation. Don't expect the world will stay the same. Do you notice if you're, if you're even 30 or 40 years old, you probably see 
The world is changing faster than it used to change. Do you see that? Okay. When my family first went to Palawan back 33 years ago, it took us a month to get a letter mailed to the U.S. and a month to get a letter back from our relatives or our church. Two months. And now all we do is pull out the cell phone, send a text, or get to Skype. Hi, Esther, our daughter. Oh, how is it in Florida today? Okay. And we're in... The world is changing quickly. And through that all, the world is coming to a climax of history that we'll be studying today and tomorrow and is preparing us for the second coming of Christ and His ruling over the world from His capital of Jerusalem, bringing peace and prosperity to all the world for 1,000 years. Now, if you read the newspaper and hear all of the terrible wars and rumors of war and problems and earthquakes and everything, uh, it's good news to read the Bible, okay? And see that, yes, there's going to be trouble, but you read the end of the book, we win, okay? Yes, there will be difficulty. Through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God, Paul said. But the end result is the church will complete its great commission and spread the gospel through all the world. Jerusalem will be ruled over by the Jews. As much as the UN tries to object, as much as the you know, Palestinians will attack the Jews, as much as they make as much trouble, no. Jesus gave a sign when the beginning of the millennium will soon be. Jerusalem again is ruled by Jews and the gospel is spread through the world. And it will be about 2,000 years from the first coming with the death of Christ until the second coming. Now, if there's any specific parts of this you don't understand well, we can point you to books that you can study them more thoroughly. Or we have a lot of scriptures we did not get a chance to thoroughly look at. I hope you will just understand very simply the second coming of Christ is near, but not yet. Okay? Have a nice little poem. Malapit na pero hindi pa. Okay? And number D in our notes, right before we have a break, many prophecies still need to be fulfilled before we will see Christ's second coming. Number one, there will be a ten-nation federation that will arise out of the old Roman Empire. And we're going to study this more thoroughly tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to be studying from the book of Revelation and Daniel, and we'll look at the, you know, the kingdoms of the world and, and uh, the end days and the Antichrist. But there will be a ten-nation federation from the old Roman Empire. Now, for centuries, for 1,500 years, the nations of Europe fought each other. World War II, World War I, uh, before that, the Napoleonic Wars, before that, you know, the Hungarian Wars, before that, they fought each other for so many centuries. Now, all of a sudden, Europe is uniting. Why? Jerusalem is being prepared for the last days. Europe is becoming prepared for the last days, and we'll study how Europe will have, again, a unified or partly unified federation like the old Roman Empire. Number two, there's going to be the rise of the great final Antichrist. And we're going to be studying that. Again, that will be tomorrow. We have some scriptures here. There will be a final battle of Jerusalem. Let's look at that in Zechariah chapter 14. As I said, the most contested piece of property in the world right now are not the gold mines of South Africa or the diamond mines of, you know, Botswana. No, the, the most valuable, most fought over piece of property in the world is Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that there will yet come a final army 
marching against Jerusalem that is going to succeed in militarily overwhelming the Jews. They will be in the process of conquering Jerusalem. The Jews' hopes will be gone in the natural. And that is when their Messiah will come to rescue them. Let's read in Zechariah chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. All the nations? Well, right now, in the United Nations, there are many laws and rules and rebukes against Israel, and usually out of how many nations in the UN? 140? 160? I don't know. Okay, out of all those over 100 nations, there's usually only one or two nations that stands with Israel, the United States and uh, the Solomon Islands or Micronesia, okay, population three, uh, or, or very small, okay? <laughs> only two nations still supporting, and the United States' support is getting thinner and weaker and weaker. The Bible says the day will come when all nations will stand against the Jews. There will be a great international army that will come, verse 2. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. Militarily, the Jewish defenses will be broken. And then it says, the houses rifled. They'll be, you know, stealing and looting in all the houses. The women ravished. They'll be raping all the women. It says, half of the city will be taken away as captives, but the remnant shall not be cut off. Half the city will be captured, and they'll be taking the people away. The other half will be fighting, but they have lost the battle. Militarily, it's hopeless. And when there is no more hope for the Jews in their own armament, in their own fighting, they're defeated, and the, and the armies are just wrapping up the defeat. Verse 3, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now in Acts 1, Jesus ascended up to heaven from the Mount of Olives and two angels told his disciples, the same Jesus you saw go up to heaven is coming back the same way. Behold, he comes in the clouds and he's coming back for his feet to stand on the Mount of Olives on the east side of Jerusalem. And he comes back right when the Jews have lost the war, before they're all destroyed, when they're, they've got no more hope unless their Messiah comes. Their Messiah will come. And he'll stand on the Mount of Olives. And then it says, at the end of verse 5, Thus, the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Jesus is not coming back from heaven alone. It says the armies of heaven, the called chosen and faithful, will return with him. There will be a great host that will follow Jesus with the army from heaven. And then it says in verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. It shall be. The Lord is one. And verse 12, the plague, the Lord will strike all of the armies, the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will melt while they stand on their feet. Their eyes will dissolve in their eye sockets. Their tongues will burn away and melt. That's a sign of such great fire, like atomic fire or some very hot fire, that while their bodies are still there, they're Eyeballs evaporate, evaporate, the tongues burned away, and there's only a skeleton there for a second before the skeletons all fall over. First Thessalonians says, The Lord shall return from heaven with flaming fire, with vengeance to destroy the wicked. And he's coming back to Jerusalem, and he will destroy the armies that are conquering Jerusalem. That will be the very end of the church age 
And when the Messiah returns, it will be the end of it will be the beginning of the age of the redeemed Jews and Gentiles. The Christians and Jews living in a worldwide kingdom of peace for a thousand years. But before that second coming will happen, there is going to be one final battle of combined armies supported sanctioned by all the nations of the world that are going to come against Jerusalem and they're going to be winning the battle when Jesus will intervene at the last moment and rescue the Jews. But that battle has not taken place yet. That's still in the future. The second coming of Christ is near, but not yet. And then number four, we've mentioned the completion of the Great Commission. The church has not yet finished its marching orders. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. I will be with you to the end of the age. And when we finish the job, the age will be completed. The army of God will be victorious. And Jesus' prophecy will have come to pass when he first said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That will come to pass. And for everyone in the Joshua generation and us older folks that are exercising and staying healthy, we want to be alive and here at the great end of the fireworks, the finale of finales, the knockout punch to the devil when Jesus returns to establish his kingdom of peace in all the world. Okay, that's the basic message so far. But we've seen that Christ's return will be soon, but not yet. And before his second coming, number two, Page one of your notes. Days of revival and judgment will come before the second coming of Christ. Now, Israel is a pattern nation in many ways for the works of God and is spoken of more in this scripture than any other. So let us first look very super quickly. Number A, the Bible talks about revival and judgment for the nation of Israel. Before judgments, God would first offer his mercy to his people, the Israelites. So number one, past seasons of revival and judgment for Jerusalem and Israel were shown us. For example, the nation was invaded 14 years after Hezekiah's revival. The Assyrians came and destroyed everything except the capital, but there was a revival just before that. And that revival gave them the strength to make it through that great trouble that came to the Israelites. Then you can study in your own time, later when Babylon destroyed the nation, 40 years before that, God gave them a great revival under Josiah. That revival saved many and prepared God's people for the troubles that were coming. Number C, that happened in the time of Christ. Before the Romans came and destroyed the city and nation, Jesus came offering salvation. The uh, apostles preached the gospel through the land. Revival before judgment. God showing his mercy before his justice. So you can read those scriptures, study your history, It's a recurrent common pattern in the nation of Israel and it's a pattern of how God works for his people to help us before times of difficulty. Now number two, there will be blessings and judgments for Israel before and at the second coming of Christ. So there are a number of scriptures you can study there that we don't have the time to do right now. But number three on the the next page, Israel has greater blessings and judgments than other nations. Israel has been a chosen nation. They are the natural children of Abraham. We Christians are the spiritual children of Abraham. But his natural descendants 
were given great blessing by God and great responsibility. So we can read in the prophet Amos in the Old Testament. God spoke to the nation of Israel in Amos chapter 3. He said, verse 1, Hear this word, the Lord has spoken against you, O Israel. Verse 2, You only have I known of all the nations of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. Israel in the Old Testament days was the only nation that had a clear knowledge of the true God. The others had wandered away and maintained some remnant of knowledge of God, some cultures scattered around the world. But the Jews maintained the pure worship of God. But our Lord Jesus said, To whom much is given, much is required. And the Jews, as the chosen people of God in the Old Testament, given great privilege, also were given great judgment for when they fell short of their high calling. Now, we can also give a parallel to this to the nation of the Philippines. Israel was the only nation chosen back in Old Testament days, but the Philippines for the last 400 years has been the only Christian nation in Asia. Christian in quotes, Christianized, that doesn't mean all born again, but a knowledge of the gospel. Okay, now there's also uh, the little nation from Indonesia. Uh, what's the name? Timor. East Timor or West? I don't remember. East, East Timor now is an independent nation, and they say that they're Christian, but they're only a couple million people. So, and historically, for so many centuries, the only Christianized nation in Asia has been the Philippines. A blessing, but to whom much is given, much will be required. So God brought blessings and responsibility to Israel, but we can also see there is a parallel for the Philippines. So in your page number two, revival and judgment in these last days for the Philippines. Number one, the Philippines is a nation beloved for the sake of the fathers. Now in Romans chapter 11, verse 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul is teaching about the nation of Israel and how God had blessed them and given them the laws of God, the service of God, the scriptures from the Jews came, the Messiah, Jesus. They had been given so much. Uh, and he said in Romans 11 that although they are temporarily far from God in the church age, they've been like the, uh, the, the vine cut off, yet they are not fully away from God. He said that Israel is partially blinded at this time. They're not fully blind. Many of the Jews believe in a coming Messiah. The only problem is <laughs> they don't know. He already came once. He will come again, yes. And he will come again for the Jews that wait for him. But he already came and his name is Jesus. But in Romans chapter 11, speaking about the nation of Israel, God has been patient with them and will restore them in the last days, has been rebuilding the nation in this last generation. Israel, a nation again after 1900 years. Jerusalem, again ruled by the Jews, although the armies against them have been huge and should have won every time. But Israel wins. Jerusalem remains for the Jews. Why? Because God is with them. And why is God with them? Let's read in Romans 11, verse 28. Concerning the gospel, the Jews in the New Testament age are enemies of the gospel. They don't understand about Jesus. But concerning the election or the choosing of God, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Okay, the nation of Israel is beloved for the sake of the fathers. Now, I have some families that are very important to me. 
there was a there was a family of a good friend of mine, Ramalo Hazona, out in Palawan back 34 years ago. Good friend, good fellow servant of God. We worked together and had a great time. He died in a motorbike accident. And I tried every year to send his widow help and for the family. A brother down in Mindanao that died. We've helped support his wife and kids, sent the money at various times. His kids are young. I don't know them all. They're beloved for the sake of the Father. Here in Mandaluya, my family has especially loved some youngsters that aren't very young anymore, but they're beloved by my family for the sake of their father, Jerry Vallier. And if someone has a relationship of love and respect for someone, they will honor their children and their grandchildren. God never forgets Abraham, his friend. And the promises he gave Abraham were not just for Abraham, but for his seed, for the nation, forever. God remembers the Israelites for the sake of their founding father, Abraham. And then there was Moses, who incorporated them in to becoming a people group with the laws of God. God gave promises to Moses, a man who talked face to face with God. And the Israelites are still beloved three and a half thousand years later because God remembers his love for his friend, Moses. David, the man after God's own heart, who helped found the kingdom. God gave promises to him and his generations forevermore. And so the Israelites are beloved by God as he remembers their founding fathers. And we can see that there can be parallels in the history of other nations. My home, original home nation, the United States, was founded by many godly Christian groups, the Puritans, the Quakers, uh, the Presbyterians, Methodists, people that uh, traveled through and preached the gospel everywhere and had revivals after revivals for centuries. When it was still a colony, not yet a nation, there was a war called the French and Indian War when the American colonies were still a part of Britain and they were fighting against the French and the Indians. That's why they called it the French and Indian War. The British and colonies against... And there was a group an army of British soldiers led by a British general, but the soldiers were almost all American colonists, people that lived in uh, the American colonies. Commander was a British general. He marched them through the forest, going after the French and the Indians. But the Indians were very wise. They hid behind the trees and stones, and at the predetermined moment, they all attacked, shot, and their chief had given them the command, first shoot the commanders riding on the horses. When you kill all their officers, then the troops will be confused and then it will be easy to destroy the whole army. So the first thing they did was shot at all of the commanders. And the British general, he was killed in the first volley of bullets. All of the other officers were killed very quickly, except for one. And the colonists... They have been trained, stand there, shoot their rifles right in full sight, and they have a hard time even seeing the Indians. Okay? But there was one brave American officer. His horse was shot out from under him. He found another horse because the officer was killed. Stood up on it to gather the troops, and then bullets went through his hat. Bullets went through his clothes several times. The second horse was shot out from under him. He got on a third horse. And he was the only officer left. And there were many very skilled sharpshooters aiming at him. And the Indian chief was amazed and said, bullets cannot hit this man. What? This is not normal. And he gathered some of his chiefs to him. And he said, the great spirit is now upon me. And wants me to speak the words of prophecy. Now the American Indians believed that there was a great creator spirit above all things. 
Unfortunately, they usually worship the little demon spirits in the trees and the rocks, you know, that were more practical for their life. But they knew there was one great spirit. And at this time of battle, this chief said, The great spirit has come to me and bids me speak in the words of prophecy. That man, that officer on the horse, shall never be killed by a bullet because he has been called by the great spirit to raise up a great nation. They never killed him in that war. They never killed him in all the other wars when he should have been killed so many times. The bullets couldn't get him. Why? His name was George Washington. And he was called of God to raise up a nation that would be important in the world. Now, America has largely backslidden in the last 20, 30, 40 years. But we still have the hope it can be beloved for the sake of the founding fathers. Okay, but another just example, a modern day example. God can watch over nations that he loves because of the people that started the nation. I could look over children or grandchildren of a friend because I can love them for the sake of their father who I had loved. But in Philippine history, the first man who united the Philippine Islands into a national identity was King Philip II of Spain. He so united the nation that the nation bears his name, the Philippines. And King Philip worked and sacrificed greatly to make the Philippines a center for Christianity, a center of the gospel. Sister Beulah has written in her book some of the quotes of King Philip II and how he said he, will sacri he was ready to sacrifice all of the money in the royal treasury of Spain if he could only make the Philippines a place where the light of the gospel would spread for Asia. Various quotes. You can read the exact quotes in her book or get them in history books. They're all over. He, wa he, he was uh, ignorant of part of the gospel back in those days, but he had an honor for Jesus Christ. And he wanted Jesus to be proclaimed throughout Asia. And by his and by the Spanish sacrifice, the Philippines became known as a Christianized nation. Not all born again, nope, but a Christian influence. It's a lot better that we sing joy to the world every year than that we aim towards Mecca and bow every Friday. Right? <laughs> a much better cultural foundation for the gospel. He worked and sacrificed to make the Philippines a place that the gospel would be spread. After the Spanish, who brought, of course, a very mixed blessing, then came the Americans as a great influence after Spain lost the Spanish-American War. And President William McKinley was advised by some to do this for the Philippines or do that or do this. And... If he didn't do anything, Germany said they were going to invade Panay because they had economic interests there. They would make it their colony, and Bacola was going to be independent, Mindanao was going to be independent, France was going to conquer one of the uh, islands that was, and they were going to, you know, the Philippines was going to be uh, dissected uh, if nothing happened after the Spanish left. And William McKinley said to a group of pastors, he sought help from uh, the politicians, from the industrialists, from every quarter. What should we do with the Philippines now that Spain has lost them in the war? And he said, one night when he was praying on his knees to Almighty God, God showed him that America should come and help the Philippines to help educate and Christianize the nation. And from that foundation of a man saying he had a word from God, America came and help the Philippines. Now, like with Joseph's brethren, you, you know, you did evil, but God meant it for good. That doesn't mean everything America did was good. Not everything Spain did was good. But you are a very international culture. You are a very international people. And all you have to do is count all the, all the overseas foreign workers and Balik Bayans and everyone to know you are unique people. You go anywhere in the world, you'll find a Filipino. Or you usually find a group, okay? <laughs> and since that time, as you've developed a, more of a national identity, as an independent nation, there was Jose Rizal, 
that first woke the nation up to the desire of a national identity. He, as a doctor, caused the blind to see, but as a writer, he caused those that were spiritually blind to see and have hopes of building a godly nation. And he was a very honorable man in many, many ways. It's good to have a national hero that's a doctor, a healer, a good man. It's better than having a national hero like Genghis Khan or Mao Zedong who, who murdered 50 million people, okay? No, it's better to have a national hero who's a man of peace. Ninoy Aquino made a big impact on the country. After he got born again and came back to the Philippines to try to help right the wrongs of the past. And when the people said, it's dangerous for you to go back to the Philippines, it's written on your money. The Filipino is worth dying for. And he proved it, not just with his words, but with his life. And that woke the nation up to see that there needed to be a change in the government and the first people's power and a reestablishment of democracy uh, in a more full sense in the Philippines. Fidel Ramos, the first Protestant president that dedicated the nation to Jesus Christ. You look at so many of your leaders. There's, there's bad ones. You'll always find the bad ones. But there's many good ones. There are many that read their Bibles, that pray to God every day. And praise the Lord, we've got a new Senator Pacquiao, right? <laughs> and how about Joel Villanueva? Is he a, is he a man of God? Uh, he's got great promise for the future with his big step up into the Senate. And there's a lot of godly people and leaders in the Philippines. And from many of your founding fathers, there is an inheritance. There is a deposit of God placed into the nation that even God looks down upon and says, I love the Philippines because I remember the dedication of King Philip II. I remember the prayers of President McKinley. I remember the sacrifice of Jose Rizal. I remember the death of Nino Aquino. I remember. We can forget many things, but God doesn't forget. And the nation is beloved for the sake of the nations. Another blessing upon the Philippines. Number two, in 1 Samuel 25, 25, there is a principle that teaches us one of the ways of God where it says about a person as his name is so he is names are often or usually symbolic or prophetic of a person's character or calling names have significance from the beginning all the way through now you find that in the scriptures you find Bethlehem, the house of bread, where Jesus, the bread of life, came from. Jerusalem, the city of peace. Malapit na pero hindi pa, okay? It will be the city of peace when Jesus, the prince of peace, rules for a thousand years. Uh, Judah, the tribe of praise. Their name means praise. And they had the place of the temple, the place of worship. Naturally, nations uh, and people's names have significance. I'm Norman. And I thought, oh, that's not in the Bible. That's no significance. Until I found out Norman comes from two words in the French language, North man. My name means man from the north. And when I heard, learned that, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I've called you to be a man from the north. So you can call me Norman all you want now. I'm, it's not Joshua or Paul or Moses, but it's, it's, I'm the man from North America. <laughs> Sent to share the good word of God in the South. So that's a great name now. Names have significance. Now, the name Thailand means land of the free. Okay, other nations have varying significations. The United States, it's a nation that will remain united. Okay, there's significance there. But the name of the Philippines came from King Philip. He got his name from Bible Philip. And so, yes, you have an inheritance from Spain spiritually, but it goes back to the Bible. Now, 
is Vietnam, does Vietnam have a Bible name? Does Japan have a Bible name? Does Australia have a Bible name? Does Malaysia have a Bible name? Does Singapore have a Bible name? You are the Philippines. And there are Philips in the Bible that have great significance in the New Testament. And I would suggest pointing you to the Deacon Philip that became the Evangelist Philip. He began as a servant, but he became an evangelist and missionary. And your nation has been known uh, in many nations for, for sending workers and, and being uh, desired for your good workers around the world. But Philip started as a servant, as a worker, and he ended up an evangelist and a missionary that evangelized the Ethiopian. They went up to the Samaritans and brought revival. May the Philippines be a nation that arises from just sending overseas people to work, but that will send overseas workers for the Lord. And if only 10% of the overseas foreign workers of the Philippines have a solid missionary of training and call, there will be more Filipino international missionaries around the world than all the rest of the nations put together. The Philippines has great potential, a great calling. You have a European inheritance, you have a North American inheritance, you're a blend of many cultures and people here in uh, Asia, genetically 25% Chinese, uh, Malaysian, you're, you're, you're hollow hollow, okay? <laughs> and, and do we all like hollow hollow, okay? <laughs> There is a blessing that God has given to your people. But the Philippines that's been blessed with many godly, good leaders. Number three, to whom much is given, much will be required. So let's look very quickly. The nation of Israel, number A, God invested much in ancient Israel to prepare them as a light to the nations. God told Abraham at the very beginning, he said, I will bless you and make you a blessing. All the scriptures in multiplying, I will multiply you. I will make your seed as the sand on the shore. God was going to abundantly bless through Abraham and his descendants. But they largely failed in their calling. Paul wrote, quoting from the Old Testament, that you have made the name of God blasphemed among the nations because of the idolatry of the nation of Israel. Amos wrote that, you only have I known of all the nations of the world, therefore I will punish you more for your sins. They knew better. And if we know better than someone else, we should not have their low standard of life. There's a saying, others may, you may not. If you know something is wrong, don't do it. Someone else may do something that's not very good, and they might be ignorant, or they might be very, you know, immature, and, and, and they don't understand it's wrong, and they will not have the same punishment. But if we know something is wrong, we need to walk in a higher light. Okay? So Israel, they were called to be a light to the nations. But they fell into idolatry and sin, and they did not go and be a light to the nations. So God sent many of them out, in your notes, number C, as slaves, prisoners of war. And when they went there, they remembered the Lord. Many of them turned back to God and were used mightily for the kingdom of God. Daniel was one of the captives taken away at the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. But when he consecrated his life to God and quickly rose through ranks of government administration, we know the day came when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and nobody could understand it. Daniel interpreted it. And that gave him an even higher government position. Time came when Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, God wanted to warn him of judgment coming. 
and he used Daniel to do it. And after Nebuchadnezzar turned back from his uh, seven times, probably seven years of insanity, he said in Daniel 3.29, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and glorify the King of Heaven who is able to humble those who walk in pride. But it was Daniel that taught him about the true God and brought him to that. Darius, in the Medo-Persian Empire, Daniel 6, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because he would worship God. Darius liked Daniel, one of his subordinates, one of his workers in his government. And he's, but, but he said, I, I've got to throw you in. It's the law. They've, we've got to obey the law. And so they threw him in. And the next day Darius came, Daniel, has your God who you serve night and day, has he rescued you? Daniel wasn't eaten by the lions. And Dan, Darius published a proclamation throughout the empire of the Middle East about that everyone should honor and tremble before the God of Daniel. There were the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that again shook the nations with the testimony of God that they had. There was even the little servant girl of Naaman, captured as a young girl and sent as a slave over to Syria. But when Naaman, the commander of the armies of Syria, became a leper and could find no medical help, she said, well, if my master would only go to the prophet in Israel, he could get healed of his leprosy. And her little testimony motivated a caravan to travel internationally and go, and for Naaman to experience a miraculous healing that made an impact and a testimony throughout those nations nearby. They didn't go willingly. They were prisoners of war. They were slaves. God told one of his prophets, Arise, go to Nineveh and preach repentance. Did Jonah go to Nineveh? He went the other way. He later said, you know, communicated, Lord, uh, I knew if I preached, you know, and they repented, you'd have mercy. But they're the enemies of Israel. They butchered our people. I don't want you to have mercy on them. So he ran the other way to disobey God. But there in the belly of a whale, Jonah had a few days to think about it. <laughs> As the air was getting worse and worse, and the seaweed was wrapped around his head, and he was down in the middle. Of, that, he had an opportunity to rethink about disobeying God. And when he decided to obey, the big fish spit him out. He went to Nineveh and started a revival that brought multitudes to humble themselves before God. Was Jonah a willing missionary? No. It's like he went kicking and screaming the wrong way <laughs> until he had to uh, surrender to God. But God used them. And after scattering many Israelites throughout the nations in the Old Testament days. Then the Lord restored the nation of Israel and prepared them for the coming of Christ, the first coming. But after scattering them, he brought them back and prepared them for the coming of Christ. Now there is a parallel between that and the Philippines. And you know, it's the Philippines has also had investment from God. God has blessed the Philippines with great natural resources. Some of it, the Philippines is one of the greatest nations in the world with chromium deposits, gold, a number of precious metals and chemicals. Uh, has great resources in the nation. A lot of oil yet to be developed. And along with that, the Philippines has had a lot of international help to come and prepare the nation to be a very international people. Now, we can have our class today in English because of your international heritage, but my first home nation almost made German their national language back in 1776. Except for four votes at the Continental Congress, the language of the United States would have been German. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Verstehen Sie meinen Sprache? Do you understand what I'm saying? 
No, nobody knows German anymore. It's not an important language of the world. But English is. It was a foreign import to my home country. It's a foreign import to your country. But it's a valuable thing to make us all internationally able to work and spread the gospel. It's part of the blessing God has given to your nation. Nations like Vietnam and uh, other nations around Asia, oh, they're English. Oh, it's, it, hi, yi, yi. We were just in Vietnam and trying to communicate can give you a headache, okay? <laughs> now, just as God has brought many blessings to the Philippines, like he gave many blessings to Israel, it's also true that past generations of the Philippines have largely failed to use those blessings to properly honor God and be a light to the nations. Back with people's power, when God so graciously rescued the nation from civil war and peaceably turned the country back to a more full democracy. I tell people the Philippines is unique around the world. Most nations, they have a civil war. They fight for years. They kill hundreds of thousands of people. In the Philippines, you want to change your government. You just go over to Edson and whoever has the biggest party wins. Okay? <laughs> they just go have a big party. And, you know, the military finds out who's the biggest, joins them. And, and then everybody, you know, gets happy. Very different. And the testimony of the peaceableness, the difference of the Filipino people. But shortly after that, I was watching, I was in a grocery store, and I watched, there was a group of TVs on, and it showed Cory Aquino under the shadow of the scary lady at Edsa, okay? <laughs> and she was, sa she was giving glory to Mary as the savior of the country. And God spoke to my heart, looking at that on the television. From Isaiah 42, I am the Lord, I change not, and I do not give my glory to graven idols. Because she has attributed my salvation of the nation to Mary, judgments will come upon the land. And shortly after that, there was Mount Pinatubo. There was the Armok flood. There was the earthquake up the Gupan up to Baguio. Many judgments that came not the testimony that should have been of the mercies and the goodness of God. Well, the nation that could have prospered, the Philippines was the number one or number two nation in Asia back 50 years ago, but quickly went down because of corruption. God wants to turn that around again. But he has he allowed economic need to send millions of overseas foreign workers because they just like the Israelites scattered to the nations many of them have brought their knowledge of God to very dark corners of the world when Kuwait was invaded by Saddam Hussein that one of the royal princesses did not have time to escape she hid herself in a hospital as a nurse there with all of the Filipino nurses and the Filipino nurses led her to Christ in those weeks she was hiding there and after the war was over and the royal family came back she said I am a Christian and the testimony shook the nation the Sultan of Brunei he's started Sharia law and he's trying so hard to uh, to stop the Christians but his son who, who will be the next Sultan his son doesn't care anything about Islam. He's not zealous for Islam. No. Well, one reason was he was raised by, was it six yayas? Who are all Pentecostals, <laughs> speaking in tongues, Filipinas. And newspapers around the Middle East have said, oh, our younger generation is corrupted. They're not zealous for Allah anymore. They've had Filipina yayas that, that slept that rocked them to sleep, singing, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And there has been a great impact 
in many nations and there will be a much greater impact of the Filipino around the world by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Most of the seamen in the world are Filipinos. Now there's over 200 nations and one nation has more than 50%. Are there any seamen here that know the modern statistics? What? 80% of the seamen traveling, mechanics on the boats, the men piloting the ships are Filipinos. 80% of the travelers around the world on the boats. You are a very international people that travel to the nations. And as revival arises upon the Philippines, God has allowed, just like Israel, God allowed them to go to many nations for economic difficulty. God has allowed many of your nation to go. But it's not just for economic reasons. It's because God has a plan. You have a missionary call on your nation. Philip, the evangelist, was a missionary. He evangelized the Ethiopian eunuch down in the Sinai. He brought revival to the Samaritans. You have a calling as evangelists, as missionaries. As your name is, so you are to be. But to whom much is given, much is required. Back, oh, do you remember what year we had the national prayer gathering at Camp Aguinaldo? 19? 91? 1991, I was the main speaker for a national prayer gathering in uh, Camp Aguinaldo. And there the Lord gave me a word for the nation from Amos chapter 3. And there the Lord said to, the, to Israel, You only have I known among all the nations. Therefore, I will judge you the more sternly. What God spoke through me was, To the Philippines, you only have I chosen from all of the nations of Asia. And therefore, I will discipline you more severely. And yes, there have been difficulties. But just as God brought difficulties to work it for good for the Israelites, God also can turn all things around and make all things beautiful in his time. And let your people around the world be a mighty testimony for Jesus as revival arises, as more people turn to Christ, as more people, more Filipinos are trained uh, to share the gospel where they go. And yet with that, God restored the nation of Israel to prepare them for the first coming of Christ. And I believe the Lord is also going to regather many Filipinos from around the world to help restore the Philippines for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because the first time that Pastor Bailey came to the Philippines, my spiritual father, the spiritual father and grandfather of, of everyone in FMCC, he had a vision that God was going to bring revival to the Philippines and use the Philippines as a missions a nation throughout Asia. On later revelations, he saw that God had called the Philippines to be like a sheep nation that would have a national reward in the millennial kingdom of Christ for, for their Christian development, their Christian maturity, their, their, their missionary witness that, that the nation of the Philippines will have a special honor in Asia in the coming kingdom of God. Israel will have the greatest honor. Jesus will live in Jerusalem, the international capital of the world for a thousand years. But the Philippines will have a special blessing from the Lord. Because from the foundations of the nation, the sacrifice of godly men, international and national, that have worked to build something good into the Philippines, your nation is beloved for the sake of the fathers. And God will remember that. And though, yes, the discipline is more upon a son of great promise. Yet, it is to prepare that when that son matures, he will be ready for great responsibilities. And so I just want to quickly point this out to you, that Israel had revival and judgment. 
the Philippines will have revival and judgment. And there has been judgment, and we want to pray that there will be much more revival. Now, number C in your notes, near the bottom of page two, there will be revival and judgment for the nations of the world in the last days. Let's read in Haggai chapter two, verse six through nine. The Lord said, once a little while, saith the Lord of hosts, I will shake the heaven and the earth. I will shake all nations and they will come to the desire of all nations. Not every translation has it that way, but it's capitalized in my New King James here. The Jews recognize that as a messianic prophecy. The desire of all nations. Some translations just say the wealth of all nations. But no, it's the desire. It's the precious one of all nations. It's the Messiah. When he shakes all nations, they will come to the precious one of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord. Verse 9, the glory of this latter house will be greater than the first. So God made a promise. There will be great shakings in the last days. There will also be great glory and people turning back to God. Let's read in Isaiah chapter 60. Another prophecy for the last days. Isaiah 60, starting in verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is arisen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord shall rise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles will come to your light. Kings will come to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes and see. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters. And it goes on. Verse uh, six, a Midian and Ephah and those from Sheba will come. Verse 7, and the flocks of Keter will be gathered to you and the rams of Nebaioth. Now, Sheba, Midian, Kedar, Nebaioth, those are all the Arab nations, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, United Arab Republic. And God says here that when there's great darkness around the world, when darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness the people. God will arise upon his people. The glory of the Lord will arise upon his church. And nations will be turning to the Lord. And four that he mentions in verse 6 and 7 are Muslim nations. There will be great revival among the Muslims in these last days. It's already started in some nations. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands turning to Christ. It's still secretly because... People often will be killed in a Muslim society if they openly confess Christ. But there is a great work of God starting among the Muslim nations when, when the glory of the Lord arises in strength around the world. There will be a great turning among the Muslims. And then Joel chapter 2, up and through chapter 3. Again, prophecies of great trouble and great revival starting in chapter 2 verse 28 it will come to pass afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters will prophesy your men will dream dreams young visions and then verse 30 wonders in the heaven and earth blood and fire 31 the sun will be turned to darkness the moon into blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord now Peter first quoted this on the day of Pentecost as starting to be fulfilled. There was a partial fulfillment started with the first coming of Christ, but this is more specifically talking about the second coming of Christ. Okay, many prophecies we'll study tomorrow. Many of the most important prophecies in Scripture have multiple fulfillment, double or triple fulfillment. How many times will Christ come? Twice. Multiple fulfillment of prophecy. How many times are the Israelites regathered from the nations? Twice. Once from Babylon, Old Testament times, and once in modern days from the nations. There is multiple fulfillment of prophecy. And this one will be most completely fulfilled, it says, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Is that the first or the second coming of the Lord? 
That's the second coming. The great and dreadful day of the Lord is speaking about when Christ returns in flaming fire to judge the world. But verse 32, it will come to pass, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So he talks about how there will be a great outpouring of the Spirit. And then he's saved. But signs in the heavens and great difficulty in the world. When? Before the great dreadful coming of the Lord. When Jesus comes back the second time as the lion, as the judge with flaming fire. Now, in your notes, yes, there will be revival and judgment for the nations, but let's specifically look at the one single most simple and clear prophecy about the last days that we will find anywhere in the Bible, and it was a prophecy spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of Bibles will print the words of Jesus in red, to show you this is the most important part, right? The red letters. And you see, if you've got a Bible like that, oh, the red letters, oh, this is Jesus speaking, okay? Now, it's important when you listen to Moses or David or anyone in the Bible, but Jesus is the most important, amen? He was the greatest prophet and teacher. And let's turn in Matthew 24, verse, chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus went departed from the temple and the disciples showed him all the temple verse 2 Jesus said do you see all these things this glorious building I will I tell you not one stone will be left upon another they will all be thrown down verse 3 as Jesus said on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately saying tell us when will these things be what things one of them is destruction of the temple that happened 70 AD but then they asked two questions what will be the sign of your coming? That's the second coming. And the end of the age? The age of the Gentiles? The church age? So one question is about the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple. Two questions about the end of the age and the second coming of Christ. So this prophecy is a blend. It starts out talking uh, somewhat about the days after Christ when Israel was destroyed, but it's mostly speaking about the sign of Christ's coming and the end of the church age. And so this prophecy tells us some very important things. And let's read what our Lord said. He divided his prophecy up into sections. The first section we can read starts from Matthew 24. Okay, let's read the first section of Jesus' prophecy, mainly speaking about the sign of his coming and the end of the age. Let's all look at our Bible, starting in verse 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. All these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Okay? Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. Verse 8. All of these things are the beginning of sorrows. Or depending on your translation, all of this first part is only the first birth pains. Okay? The beginning of sorrows or the beginning of a woman in travail that is going to give birth. So this whole section, Jesus said, the end is not yet. This is only the beginning of the birthing process. Okay? This is the beginning. Then after, and in this section, Jesus talked about deception. He talked about trouble among the nations. He talked about uh, earthquakes. And that all of these things would just be the start of the birthing process. Now, I read over 25 years ago in a Time magazine how a number of scientists, they were not Christians, but scientists had made a chart of the developing earthquakes around the world, developing earthquakes around the world. And this chart showed that 
the earthquakes were getting stronger and then stopping for a while, getting stronger, stopping for a while, getting stronger. And the time between these periods of, of earthquakes was getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So the graph said the earthquakes are getting stronger and faster and faster. And they said it's the same chart as if you put a belt around a woman in travail, they have a machine with a belt to show the birth pangs of a woman in a hospital. And if you just look at it, you say, okay, you know, okay, it was 10 minutes between contractions, now it's eight, now it's seven, six, okay, the baby should be here in maybe, maybe an hour. Okay, they use that in hospitals sometimes. Well, they said the graph that they made, just showing the earthquakes, it was the same as a woman in travail. The pain's growing stronger and faster. Now, they weren't Christians, and they didn't know that Paul wrote almost 2,000 years ago that the world is groaning in travail, waiting for the curse from Adam upon the sons of men to be lifted up, that at the second coming of Christ, the sons of God, the, the restored humanity, will uh, again arise and the curse of Adam will be lifted from the world. Well, the earth groans in birth pangs, but we call them earthquakes. And they're getting faster and stronger. Now, I wish I could have talked to those scientists. I would have wanted to tell them, when do you estimate the baby will come? Okay? <laughs> but I couldn't write them. I didn't know them and couldn't do that. But even secular scientists are saying that something is coming. The earthquakes are pointing to a finale. What will be the finale? It will be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. But many of these things are only the beginning of birth pangs, Jesus said. Then, after this beginning of sorrows, in verse 4 to 8, he tells us there is a new step forward in the last days. Verse 9, then, so that then is after this beginning of the sorrows. Then after that, things will get worse. He says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended and betray one another. Verse 11, false prophets. Verse 12, the love of many Christians will grow cold. Verse 13, he who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Okay? And this section, Jesus is talking about tribulation that this will be a time of great difficulty because in verse 9 Jesus said then they will deliver you up to tribulation do you see that after the birth pangs have been beginning then will come a time of tribulation and that tribulation will include backsliding Christians persecution Persecutions are arising around the world. In the first three centuries of church history, about a million Christians died as martyrs. In the 20th century, 1900 to 2000, more Christians died than in all of the rest of history combined. Died as martyrs for their faith. Martyrdom, persecution of Christians, is growing in most nations and it will continue until Jesus said you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake the day will come when if you say she is a he he calls herself a she but she is really a he okay <laughs> if you as a Christian will say that the day will come you'll be hated by all nations. Okay? People that will stand for righteousness in the last days will find persecution 
increasing. But with this all, the gospel of the kingdom will continue to be spread. But Jesus said, this will be tribulation. So the first part is birth pangs. First part will be birth pangs. The second part will be tribulation. But then Jesus takes this a step further, starting in verse 15. Let's read. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, let those in Judea flee to the mountains and the housetop not go down uh, in the field. Woe to those who are pregnant. Uh, verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation. Okay, so starting with the abomination of desolation, Jesus said there will come great tribulation. Now when Jesus began speaking about the last days, Let's read verse 6 again. Okay? You'll hear of wars and rumors of war, but don't be troubled. All these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. Malapit na pero hindi pa. Okay? But then he talks about things will get worse. Verse 9. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. And then later, in these last days, after the troubles described here. Then when the abomination of desolation comes, and then there will be great tribulation. So the good news is that things will get better, but the sad news is, first, things will get worse and worse and worse. Okay? Jesus will come back and make everything right. But before he comes back, the world is going to get go through birth pangs and then go into tribulation and then go into great tribulation. Step by step. Worse. Darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise on you and nations will come to your light. There will be revival as well as judgment in these last days. And then after this time of great tribulation that Jesus spoke about there. Then, we won't read it all, the things that he prophesied, but in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, so after the birth pangs and the tribulation and the great tribulation, after all these troubles, Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall, Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and gather together his elect from the four corners of the world. Jesus gives his prophecy of the last days in sections. First section, verse 4 through 8. It's only the beginning of the birth pangs. But after that, things will get worse. And he says, then you will have tribulation. And then after that is fulfilled in modern history, then Jesus said, after the abomination of desolation, then there will be great tribulation. And after all of these troubles of the last days are done, Jesus said, you will see the sign of the Son of Man as He comes in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And with the sound of a trumpet, doo -doo 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 -doo, He will gather together the elect from around the world and He will establish His kingdom of peace in all the world. That is a very quick, simple prophecy of the last days. It's by our Lord Jesus himself. He gave it simple and step by step. The beginning of birth pangs, but not the end yet. Then it will get worse and become tribulation. Then it will get even worse and become great tribulation. And after all the troubles, Jesus will return. Things will get great with the second coming, but before that time, things will get worse and worse. Okay? <laughs> 
But in the midst of that trouble, there will be a triumphant church. There will be revivals. There will be bold testimonies of Jesus Christ. And the power of God will spread the gospel throughout all the earth before the end will come. Number three, the church will be raptured to meet the Lord in the air. This is an important part of the second coming. And in our notes, we can read that we can differ in understanding end time events such as the rapture. Okay, if you have a different understanding of it than me, you're my brother and sister, I love you. If I teach something different than, oh, than how you see it, uh, I hope you don't have to throw stones at me, but you can love me too, okay? Our foundation, our testimony, our unity is not based on our end time doctrinal every little thing. Our unity as Christians is found in the salvation of Jesus Christ and our walking in the light to live godly lives. If you are saved and you're trying to walk as a righteous Christian, I'm here for you. I am your brother. I am your servant. We are here to build together, not just argue doctrine. But I did feel a need for this time of teaching these two days because we are getting more and more into the last days. We are going to see these things becoming more and more fulfilled and you need to become prepared. Prepared with good doctrine. If you have bad doctrine, you might be getting, chasing around and saying, oh, well, we've heard there's going to be an earthquake in Japan, so quick, we have to send some intercessors to Japan to stop the earthquake. And then when no earthquake comes, they can pat themselves on the back and say, good job, there was no earthquake. Well, that depends on whether it was a true prophecy. <laughs> okay? The body of Christ can get involved in a lot of wrong directions that are not important, are confusing, or sometimes are going against the direction God is going. So we started with the big picture. God is reforming Israel to prepare for his kingdom on the earth from the international capital of Jerusalem. The big picture is Jesus will build a triumphant church that is going to spread the gospel through all the world. And after the whole world has heard the gospel and the army of God has finished its great commission, then the end of the age will come. Is that big picture simple enough? This is what we want to aim at above all. But there are important medium-sized things that we need to look at. And one very important one is the rapture. Okay? But if we don't understand or agree on them, we can still be brethren preaching the gospel, spreading the gospel, building the kingdom of God, building righteousness into people's lives, even if we're not perfectly agreed on end time doctrine. And I think every person in the world will have a slightly different view of the last days. Okay? Number B in our notes. There are three main interpretations about the rapture. Number one is the pre-tribulation rapture, that before great tribulation comes to the world, the church will be caught up to be with Christ and will, be, uh, will escape the coming time of trouble. Now that is mostly based on 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. So let's all turn in our Bibles, or okay, we've got it on the overhead. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, verse 17, then we who are alive and remain, all of the Christians still alive, not dead, but alive and remaining on the earth, will be caught up together with the dead in Christ rising, caught up together with them into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will all live happily ever after. Okay? The end of the, of the story of stories. 
Okay, well, then we will always be with the Lord. Now that is the scripture, the main one that is spoken about by pre-tribulation rapture people, along with a no number of others we'll have to look at. Another doctrine of rapture talks about a mid-tribulation rapture. And this is largely based with many other scriptures on Revelation 12. Now let's get Revelation 12, verse 5. Okay. And it says, She, the heavenly woman, bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Okay, this heavenly woman bears a male child that gets caught up to God. That's the same word in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. We, your life and reign, will be caught up. We'll study that that's the word that we say in English, rapture. Caught up or rapture. Okay? And so this talks about another catching up. And this is not about... Uh, this is seems significantly different than what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And by tomorrow, we will study in depth Revelation chapter 12, so you will understand that. But this takes place in what's commonly called the middle of the tribulation, or right before the last three and a half years of great tribulation. Just to start very simple, this is speaking of a rapture that... Some, uh, many people will say, is in the middle of the tribulation. So there is a before tribulation. Uh, the church might be caught up then. Or the church or a group of the church could be caught up as spoken of in Revelation 12. And the timing there is different. That's the middle of the tribulation. And then number three, there is also a post-tribulation rapture people who believe, again from 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 and many scriptures, that the dead in Christ will be raised and the living Christians will be caught up, raptured in the clouds to meet the Lord. But this will be after all the days of tribulation. When Jesus comes back as the conquering king, the church will rise up to meet him in a rapture after tribulation. Okay, these are the three main uh, things that are taught by different Christian groups. And there are a lot of variations. You can uh, look at two raptures, uh, or I've even heard of a, a very good man of God who I think didn't have the best of theology, but he talked about three raptures, okay? <laughs> and there are other people that say, I don't think there's going to be any raptures, okay? So there are a lot of possibilities, but let's spend some time looking into the scriptures because you cannot just take one prophetic scripture and let it tell you everything. It's like the pieces of a puzzle. If you have one piece of a puzzle, you might say, oh, there's a little bit of red. Uh, is that a flower? I, I can't tell. Okay, with one piece of a puzzle. But if you put the whole puzzle together, you'll see, oh, that wasn't a flower. Oh, that's part of a car. Oh, that's, a, that's an automobile. There are different scriptures, prophetic scriptures, that if you just take one here or one there, you can't see the big picture. And if you stick them together the wrong way, what happens if you stick the pieces of a puzzle together the wrong way? You're going to come up with a pretty crazy picture, right? And you'll say, that doesn't look right. Uh, oh, oh, I see it. It doesn't quite fit. Okay? But we have to put all of the prophetic scriptures together before we can see, every, see the big picture, see the complete picture. So we'll start to try to do that in this session and then after our evening meal. Okay? Let's look at number C, a definition of rapture. The Greek word harpazo is used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 when Paul said, we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Harpazo. 
to meet the Lord. This word from the Greek language means to seize, to catch, to grab, to force, to pull away. Okay? Its Latin equivalent is a word, rapari, and it means to seize or take away. From this Latin word, rapari, we have two English words, rape and rapture. Now, rape speaks of the negative use of being taken away by force. And rapture speaks of a positive, uh, oh, I was raptured when I heard that beautiful music. Oh, my soul just flew, you know. Uh, it can be spoken of positively. But they both come from a Latin word that comes from the Greek word caught up. So when we talk about the biblical doctrine of the rapture or the raptures or when is the rapture, it's speaking about when is the catching up. Now we don't say uh, we are going to speak this morning on the doctrine of the harpazo, okay, because that's Greek. And we're not going to say we're going to talk about the rapari because that's Latin and we don't speak Latin. But when we talk about rapture, we are talking about a biblical idea. It is a scriptural word from a, not the original Bible language. It was the Greek into Latin, and then the Latin was changed a little into English. And I'm not sure exactly what you'd use for Tagalog or Ilocano, okay? Or another language. But rapture is a scriptural word, although you don't see rapture, in English translations. They'll usually say caught up or taken away. But it's the same concept. Rapture is a biblical concept. Number D, what is the rapture of the church? The rapture is a doctrine explaining what happens to the worldwide church when we are caught up to meet the Lord at the second coming of Christ. It will happen to every Christian that is alive on the earth at that time. Paul said, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. Paul didn't say, Then the most spiritual Christians will be caught up. No, he was writing to Christians, and he was saying to the Christians, We who are alive and remain, the Christians that are alive at the end, will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. This is talking about the church of Jesus Christ, believers, all believers, rising up in the air to meet the Lord Jesus. And then we will ever be with the Lord. Okay? But number E, when will the rapture of the church take place? This is where we need to take the different scriptures, like pieces of a puzzle, and put them together to see how they all work together to say the same thing. So let's start in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Paul again said there, the rapture will take place with the general resurrection of the dead Christians. He said in verse 16, please. Okay? Starting in verse 16. Okay, 4.16. We're getting there. Malapit na, pero hindi pa. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That means all of the Christians that died and left their bodies in the ground, their dead bodies will come out of the graves. Now, when Jesus comes back from heaven... He's not coming alone. He's coming with the armies of heaven, with the spirits of the Christians that died, their bodies were buried, but their spirit went up to heaven. So we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, about heaven, that in heaven are the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, this, the people in heaven have a spiritual bo body in the spiritual heavens, but it is not a physical body. Jesus has a resurrected physical body in heaven. Okay? But the saints 
are spirits. They have left their body on earth. When the Christ comes back with the Christians, the, their bodies are going to rise from the graves so they can be joined with the spirits, with the actual living person coming back from heaven. But as the dead are raised, verse 17, Then, secondly, after the dead in Christ rise first, then second, we who are alive and remain will be caught up, raptured, together with them. Okay, the dead, raised, and the living, together will be caught up or raptured into the clouds to meet the Lord. Okay? So the rapture of the living Christians will take place when the dead in Christ are raised and their dead bodies will come up, be met with their spirits coming from heaven, and we who are alive will together with the dead resurrected ones caught up. So do you see right here the rapture of the church will take place at the time when the dead Christians are raised. Do we see that? Okay, first, the dead in Christ will rise. Then, second, we are alive. We will be caught up together with them. Both at the same time. First the dead and then the living will together be raptured. So that's the first very important thing. The rapture of the living Christians will take place when the dead in Christ, when there is the resurrection of the dead Christians. Now let's turn in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, which tells us about the first resurrection. Let's read this together. Look in your Bibles if the screen is too small. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them. Now this is Revelation 20. This is after the second uh, coming of Christ in Revelation 19. Do we all remember Revelation 19 talks about Christ returning from heaven on a white horse with the armies of heaven? After Christ returns, then we read the next thing in Revelation 20 about uh, you know Satan being cast into a pit, verse 3. Verse 4, I saw thrones, and they sat on them. What? The resurrected Christians. Judgment was committed to them. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their, on their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's the millennial reign of the Christians with Jesus ruling the world. And then verse 5, the rest of the dead did not live again until the end of the thousand years. And speaking of this beginning, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is a part in the first resurrection. The next verse 6. Okay? So it's talking about a first resurrection at the beginning of the millennium. Jesus returns. There is a resurrection of the dead. And the dead in Christ will rule with Christ. But there's a description of many of these who are raised at this first resurrection. Verse 4, let's go back there. It says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And then, end of verse 5, this is the first resurrection. So this first resurrection of Christians will take place at the beginning of the millennium. The second general resurrection will take place at the end of the millennium, the end of the thousand years of Christ's kingdom, when the people who lived in those thousand years, it will be their turn to stand before God the judge. That will be the second great resurrection. That's spoken of later in chapter 20. But the first resurrection great general resurrection of people is at the beginning of the millennium Christ returned 
And these resurrected saints in the first resurrection will rule the nations. But it says about them that they had been beheaded, they had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their forehead or hand. These are the ones in the first resurrection. And when is the first resurrection? The first great gathering of the dead? 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, voice of an archangel, trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive will be caught up together with them, raptured. The first resurrection, which includes people who did not take the mark of the beast, or worship the image. That first resurrection takes place with the rapture of the living Christians. And the dead include those that died because they would not take the mark of the beast or worship his image. So this first resurrection is after the beast and the mark of the beast and receiving the mark on the forehead or hand or dying. Do we understand this? Because in this first resurrection, some of them died because they would not submit to the mark of the beast, of the Antichrist. And if they died and were resurrected with the living Christians in the rapture, they could not be killed for not taking the mark of the beast if this rapture is before the Antichrist comes. Because if this general resurrection, the dead in Christ rise first and we are alive, are raptured with them, if that takes place before the Antichrist comes, then they couldn't be killed for not taking the mark of the beast. So this here says, the first resurrection when we who are alive and remain will be caught up, raptured, it takes place after the mark of the beast and Christians will die for not obeying that order. Now, let's also read in number three of your notes, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Second Thessalonians. An important scripture about the Antichrist in the last days. And we will be studying that, this chapter very uh, detailed tomorrow in class. Second Thessalonians 2, starting verse 1. Paul is writing, Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and are gathering together to him. What coming of our Lord Jesus is being spoken of here? Is he talking about the first coming or the second coming? Second coming, because he's also talking about our gathering together to him. This is the rapture, the gathering of the Christians. Jesus said, there will be the sound of the great trumpet, and they will gather the elect from the four corners of the world. First Thessalonians, there will be the shout of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and will be raised and caught up into the clouds. But here, Paul says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus, that's the second coming, and our gathering together to him, this is the rapture, the gathering of the church, we ask you, verse 2, not to be troubled in mind or by spirit or word or by letter as though it was from us, as though the day of Christ had come. He's saying, don't be troubled, the day of Christ has not come. Verse 3, let no one deceive you. That day, what day? The day of the coming of Christ and our gathering to him. That's what he started out talking about in verse 1. Okay, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. That's what he was talking about. Verse 3, he says, that day will not come unless... There is a falling away first, a backsliding, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts all that is called God or is worshipped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, 
showing that he is God. Okay, this is speaking about the Antichrist. And Paul said, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and are being gathered together to him, raptured to meet the Lord and always be with him, he said, that day will not come unless there's a falling away and the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed. So Paul is saying, don't be confused as though we wrote or there's a word or a spirit or a prophecy. Don't be shaken about this as though the day of Christ has come. That day will not come until the Antichrist is first revealed. That's what Paul is saying here. Now let's continue on to see if other scriptures correspond and say this because many good Christians would disagree. Well, that's not what's being talked about here. Well, we need to make sure that we put all of the puzzle pieces together and see if they all say the same thing. So let's keep looking at more scriptures. Okay, page four of your notes. The rapture will take place with the great last trumpet. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Lord will descend from heaven. This is his coming back with a shout, with an archangel having a voice. And, woo, doo -doo -doo, and the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. Next verse 17. And we who are alive, the Christians alive, will be caught up, raptured together with the resurrected Christians to meet the Lord in the air and then we'll always be with the Lord. This happens with a great trumpet. Did we see that? Let's see verse 16. With the trumpet of God. Okay. Trumpet will blow. Doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. And when the trumpet blows, the dead in Christ will come out of their graves. And then we who are alive will be raptured together with them with a trumpet when the dead are raised now let's look at another scripture Matthew 24 starting in verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days sun will be dark and moon will not give its light next verse then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven the people will mourn they'll see the son of man coming from heaven with power and great glory and he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven from from the clouds from everywhere they're going to be gathered okay jesus says this is immediately after the tribulation that the elect will be gathered with the sound of a great trumpet okay first thessalonians 4 the lord will descend shout of the ark angel and the trumpet of god the dead will be raised will be gathered in the clouds and here it says in matthew 24 verse 31 that with the sound great sound of a trumpet he will gather together his elect the believers will be gathered from around the world caught up into the clouds and gathered now, Thessalonians called it a trumpet of God. Here Jesus says, a great sound of a trumpet. How loud is that trumpet going to be? It's going to be great. It's going to be so great, it's going to raise the dead out of their coffins, out from the ground. The dead will hear the trumpet, the great trumpet of God. Now, let's also... Look in 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 51 and 52. Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead. And he said in verse 51, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, or meaning not all remain dead, but we will all be changed. 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised. Now, Jesus is coming back from heaven, 1 Thessalonians 4, 
For the sound of a trumpet, the dead will be raised. Here we read, in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the dead will be raised at the sound of the last trumpet. Do you see how these work together? Trumpet of God, 1 Thessalonians, with the resurrection. Great trumpet, Matthew 24, the elect gathered. 1 Corinthians 15, the last trumpet, and the dead will be raised. It's all speaking about a trumpet, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it's the last trumpet. Now, it's the same word used throughout the New Testament for trumpet. Okay, in the Greek, it's the word salpinx. It's used all over. But if you want to find where the last trumpet is in the Bible, in world history, we have to turn in the book of Revelation and we have to look in chapter 11. Now, do we all know that there's the blowing of seven trumpets in the book of Revelation? Well, we want to... We'll look at the seven trumpets more tomorrow, but we just want to look now at the last trumpet because in 1 Corinthians 15... Paul said, at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised. And when the dead are raised, the living Christians will be caught up together with them in the rapture to meet the Lord in the air. Well, the last trumpet we find in the Bible, you can use a concordance or a word search or a computer generator, they'll all tell you the same thing, is in Revelation chapter 15, And we can read about a lot of different trumpets blowing. Uh, for example, uh, back in uh, earlier chapters, there's the blowing of trumpets. But the very last one mentioned, starting in verse 15, excuse me, Revelation 11. Do I have that? Okay, yeah, verse 15. Sorry, I was on chapter 15. Okay, it says, Then the seventh angel sounded. Now, what did he sound? You read all through there. He, it's, they're tr blowing trumpets. Okay? The seventh angel sounded, and there was loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ, and He will reign forever. At the last trumpet... The first declaration is, now the world is ruled by Jesus. All the kingdoms have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and he will reign forever. So this is speaking of Christ returning and starting his rulership over the world. Where? At the seventh angel blowing his trumpet. And then, verse 16, the 24 elders... Uh, fall, uh, get off their thrones, fall on their faces in worship, and saying, verse 17, We give thanks to you, O Lord. You have taken up your great power and reigned. Verse 18, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants. Okay? So at this last blowing of the last trumpet, it says, now Jesus will rule the kingdoms of the world. And, they, and the elders worship and say, it's time for the dead to be judged and rewarded. It's after the dead are raised. They'll stand before Christ and be rewarded. So at the last trumpet, it speaks of Jesus starting to rule the kingdoms of the world and the dead entering into their reward. And what's the reward for some of the, uh, for the righteous dead in Revelation 20? They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And they will rule the world with Christ as the King of Kings. And we will be given lesser positions of ruling the world to make a great glorious kingdom of God on the earth for 1,000 years. But when does this start? Well... At the last trumpet, the dead in Christ will be raised, Revelation 15. The last trumpet in the Bible is Revelation 11. 
And there it says, the dead will be judged and rewarded. That's speaking of a resurrection and they're rewarded. And it's the time that Jesus will begin to rule the kingdoms of the world. This is at the last trumpet and it's in Revelation 11. And people who believe in a rapture before the tribulation would have to say that the church was raptured in Revelation 4 or 5 or 6 before the troubles come. Revelation 11 is right in the middle of all of the troubles of chapters 6 through 17 or 18. The chapters, middle chapters of Revelation, speaking of the troubles of the last days, Revelation 11 is right in the middle of them. And at the last trumpet, there is the resurrection and the reward of the dead. Last trumpet. It's not before tribulation. Okay? It's the last trumpet. And when you read what happened with the other trumpets, hi, all kinds of troubles. You know, mountain falling from the sky, polluting the world, uh, sun burning up, and uh, people being in pain from torment, and all kind, and you know, the rivers dying, all kinds of trouble when the trumpets blow. And it's after all these troubles, the last trumpet, the dead in Christ are raised, and we who are alive and remain, together with them, will be raptured. All of these scriptures point to a rapture, not before tribulation of the last days, but at the end of these judgments and troubles. Okay? Now, let's look at number G in our notes. Will there be a secret rapture of the church before the great tribulation? How many of you have seen some of the old movies or even the new Left Behind? Have you seen the Left Behind movies? All of a sudden, the airplane has no pilot or the cars crash because the Christian disappeared and, you know, or some old ones. Uh, when my wife was young, they had one where uh, I think a man was showering and, and the wife said, where are you, honey, where are you? And she goes there, the water's on, soap's on the ground. Walantao, okay? He was captured and the Asawa was left behind, Okay. And she even went to her mom and said, Mom, you know, there's going to be a time when I'm going to disappear. She, her mother wasn't a Christian, a Catholic. There's going to be a time when all the Christians are going to disappear and I, I'll be gone, you know, and, and then there will be an Antichrist that will tell you to put a mark on. Don't take the mark, you know. You turn to Jesus and, and, and you can be saved too. And the mom's, yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> well... My wife developed her evangelistic techniques and abilities, and her mom did come to Christ, okay? <laughs> but it wasn't because of the, the, the Left Behind movie, okay? Or, or the good start at trying to uh, warn her mom. But there are a lot of movies and uh, the Left Behind series of Tim LaHaye books uh, that uh, suggest... There will be a, you know, rapture, a secret rapture of the church before days of trouble come. And it's important that we look at the scriptures to see if this is a balanced way of putting all of the prophetic scriptures together. Is that taking some scriptures, putting them together wrong? How do we put them all together right to have one picture saying the same thing? Okay, will there be a secret rapture? Number one. Starting from the history of the church. History tells us in the last 180 years, many Christians have come to believe in a secret rapture before the Great Tribulation. We could call it a pre-tribulation or a pre-trib rapture. Uh, Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, biggest selling book in America in the 1970s. He talked about how the Christians were all going to be secretly raptured soon. Uh, Tim LaHaye, left behind many different people teaching this a secret rapture before days of trouble however the first 1800 years of church history all the Christians the Baptists the Lutherans the uh, Methodists the Presbyterians the Waldensians 
uh, the, uh, the Boga Mills, uh, everybody, back to the early church fathers in the 3rd and 4th century, they all said, 99.99% of them, that the rapture of 1 Thessalonians 4.17 was when Christ returns to rule the world, not seven years before, not a secret coming. Okay, so this is a new doctrine when you look at the whole 2,000 years of church history, that there will be a secret rapture. It was not the doctrine held by 99.99% of the Bible teachers before that time. Now, number two, is there going to be a quiet, secret, pre-tribulation rapture? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4.16 again. The Lord will descend from heaven with a... That didn't sound appropriate. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. That doesn't sound very quiet and secret, does it? And with the voice of the archangel. And with the trumpet of God. Does this sound like a quiet event? And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, uh, there will be the sound of a great trumpet. It doesn't sound very quiet to me, okay? And let's read in Matthew 24, verse 26 and 27, what our Lord Jesus said about his second coming. If they say to you, look, he's in the desert. Do not go out. Or lo, he's in the inner rooms. He's hiding in the inner rooms. Don't believe him. Don't believe them. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. He was saying it's not going to be in a secret place. It's not going to be in a hidden room. The coming of Christ will be like the lightning that's seen from the east to the west. He doesn't call it a quiet event. No, but very public. And later he said in verse 31, He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet that's going to be the last trumpet when they declare the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and he will reign forever and the time for the dead to be judged and rewarded it has come and the dead in Christ shall rise and we who are alive will be caught up together raptured together with the dead in Christ to meet the Lord and always be with the Lord forever. So Jesus did not say that it's going to be a secret coming of Christ. He said it's going to be a very public, loud event. Now, number three in the notes. Can there be a pre-tribulation rapture at any moment? Well, number A, we already began to look that there are many prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled before Christ's coming. And we'll look at that a lot more uh, tomorrow. But for example, we read in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1 through 3, uh, Now consider, brethren, by the coming of our Lord and our gathering together to Him, don't be shaken by word or, or letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ has come. That day will not come until the man of sin is first revealed. That's what Paul said. He didn't say there would be a secret catching up before the Antichrist, the man of sin who wants to be worshipped by the world. Will there be a secret pre-trip? No, many scriptures say there are prophecies yet to be fulfilled. If someone says, turn to Jesus. Jesus might return tonight and you'll be left behind. Well, you might have a heart attack and Jesus might come for you. Okay. But Jesus is not coming for the worldwide church tonight because there are many things still to be fulfilled. There will be a final uh, uh, fulfillment of the Great Commission. There will be a last battle where the Jews will be losing the battle for Jerusalem when Christ will return to rescue them and destroy the armies invading Jerusalem. Israel and Jerusalem. Number B, 
Can there be a pre-trib rapture near the end of bottom of verse four, no, page four? B. Jesus taught that the rapture or the gathering together of the elect takes place after the tribulation. Okay, Matthew twenty-four twenty-nine. Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the stars will fall. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear, and all the earth will see the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and gather together the elect. He said that's after the tribulation, not before the days of trouble at the end of the church age. Now, Number C, Paul also taught that there will be no coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him until after the man of sin is revealed. We read that in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Now, number D in your notes. The rapture of the church is clearly declared to take place with the trumpet when the dead in Christ are raised. Okay, we read that in 1 Thessalonians 4. The, void, the Lord will return with the you know, voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will be raised. And the time for the dead in Christ to be raised, in First Thessalonians 15, is the last trumpet. Okay? And that has to be after the trumpets of Revelation chapter 8 and 9 and 11. Because the last trumpet is the first general resurrection of the dead okay and this happens after let's read Revelation 7 14 in Revelation 7 14 we read about a great group of saved Christians in heaven rejoicing starting in verse 9 Revelation 7 verse 9 after this I beheld a great number uh, from all nations, tribes, people standing before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, white robes meaning they were saved Christians, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to God and the Lamb. And they worshipped. And then it says uh, in verse 13, one of the elders said to me, who are these clothed in white robes? And where did they come from? Verse 14, John replied to the angel, sir, you know, and so the angel replied to John, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, the great tribulation is being spoken of in Revelation 7. Okay? But it's after this great multitude have died in the great tribulation, chapter 8, verse 2, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And then, verse 6, the seven angels prepared to sound. Verse 7, the first angel sounded, and hail and fallow and blood were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up. Verse 8, the second angel sounded. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown in the sea. A third of the sea became blood. Then verse 10, a great angel then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven. And a third of the rivers uh, were, were, were polluted, and many died. Verse 11. So these trumpets happen after a great multitude die in the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is mentioned by name in Revelation 7. And then after that, in Revelation 8 and 9 and 11, we get the seven trumpets. And at the last trumpet, the kingdoms of the world will become ruled by Christ. And the dead will be raised and rewarded. But this is after great tribulation, not before. Now, could there be a pre-tribulation rapture at any moment? Another scripture that tells us no is number E, the bottom of page 4. Christ gave his great commission to the church and said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
Jesus did not say to his disciples, I will be with you until seven years before the end of the age. No, he said, go and preach the gospel. I will be with you until the end of the church age. I'll be with you until my second coming. He didn't say that there will be a pre-tribulation, secret rapture. Number four at the bottom of page four. Will Christians escape suffering by its pre-tribulation rapture? Number A. Jesus did not promise his people they would escape tribulation. Jesus instead said that we would have tribulation. Let's read his words in John 16, 33. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. He did not say, you will all be raptured before tribulation comes. No. He said the church will prevail, will overcome the gates of hell. He did not say the church will be raptured to hide from the gates of hell. He said the church will have victory, not escape. In this world you will have tribulation. Okay? And then let's read in John 17, 15. Again, the words of our Lord Jesus. Jesus was praying in John 17. Part of his prayer, I do not pray, he was praying to the Father, that you will take them, the disciples, out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Jesus did not pray that Christians would be taken out of the world, but that Christians would be protected in the world. If after we become a Christian, God wants to protect us from all evil and all trouble, then when a pastor water baptizes the new convert, he should leave them under the water six, seven, eight minutes, and they'll all go to heaven, drowned by their loving pastor, so that they will see no evil, have no trouble in the world. They'll go straight to heaven where they'll always be happy and joy and no problems. Is that God's plan for the Christian? God's plan for the Christian is not that we will always escape the trouble of the world, but that he will be with us until the end. He will have a triumphant people that will learn to be overcomers, not hiders or escapers, overcomers that will, that will destroy, that will break through and overcome the gates of hell, that will preach the gospel into all the world, that will have tribulation, but will overcome it by the grace of God. And so it's not healthy to tell Christians, well, before any trouble comes, we're all going to disappear. Well, a lot of people already have a lot of problems. And this doctrine was taught in China back in the 1940s. Well, before trouble really comes, we'll all be raptured. Well, the rapture didn't come, but Mao Zedong came and killed millions of Christians and made the rest suffer in hard labor camps, starving, persecuted, brainwashed. And years later, when missionaries came back to China, a lot of the Christians, the ones that survived and kept the faith, they said, get thee behind me, Satan. And the missionary says, I taught you about Jesus. And the Christian said, you said there'd be no suffering. I'm the only one left alive in my family. They were not prepared for the trouble that would come. Jesus wants to make us strong. But if we are all expecting to escape trouble, you will never pray. You'll never be ready to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so it's important that we have the right vision of the last days so that we can have the right preparation. If a pre-tribulation rapture was true, I would be as, I'd be one of the happiest ones here. Hallelujah, that would be great if there were no troubles. But Jesus is preparing his church 
for the greatest victory at the end for preaching the gospel through all the world that we will not be taken out from the world but we will be protected triumphantly from the evil one what happened to God's people in Egypt when he came to judge e Egypt the sun was turned to dark the frogs came and corrupted the land the cattle all died there was lice there was disease there was uh, a plague after plague judgment after judgment did Jesus take his people away from those difficulties or did he protect them in those difficulties the Israelites did not leave Egypt until after all the plagues they triumphed the Egyptians saw the power of God protecting the Israelites in the middle of the trouble. Let's read Exodus 9, 6, for example. So all the livestock of Egypt died, but of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. God supernaturally protected all of the animals of the Israelites while all of Egypt's animals died. They were there in the middle of the plague, but God protected them. Verse 26, chapter 9. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. But all around them in the rest of Egypt, there was hail. People died from the big hailstorms. Crops were destroyed. But the Israelites were protected in the middle of that trouble. Exodus 10, verse 22 and 23. Moses stretched out his hand to heaven and there was darkness in Egypt three days. They could not see one another, but the children of Israel had light. In the middle of the plagues and the judgments, God did not remove his people. He gave his people victory in those difficulties. He protected them in the midst. And Jesus said, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you will keep them protect them from the evil one he that dwells in the secret place of the Lord Psalm 91 does not say will be secretly taken away no though a thousand will fall at one side ten thousand at the other it will not come near you you will be protected in the middle of the trouble God will show his power and glory for the Israelites when he judged Egypt for the world, when he judges the world at the end of the church age. The church will be triumphant. And if we see how all of these scriptures work together, that will be our vision to build, to be part of a triumphant church that can go through difficulty, not escape difficulty. Now, if we could stay away from problems. We all try. We don't put a sign on our front door, welcome every trouble, you know, come here. Uh, you know, all robbers, murderers, come, my door is open for you. You know, we don't invite trouble, but we have to be ready for it. Paul said through much tribulation, we will enter the kingdom of God. We're on page five. And we talked about how Jesus did not guarantee that we will all have a secret rapture to escape trouble, but that he will give us strength to endure. He did not pray that we will be taken out of the world, but that we would be kept in the world. Let's look at number five. What did Jesus mean when he said there will be two people? One will be taken and the other left. Let's read that in Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Okay, this is talking about the last days. It's talking about how there will be a separation of the righteous and the wicked. Is this saying that the righteous will be taken away and the wicked will be left? Or is this saying that the wicked will be judged and destroyed and the righteous will remain? Those are the two possibilities. Okay? And 
Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, it will be. Matthew 24, verse 37. As in the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Can we have verse 37 and 38? In the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Till Noah entered the ark, verse 39, did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one taken, one left. Okay, so Jesus paralleled the sudden taking away of people, right? Instantly, just right in the middle of things, to being like the days of Noah. And also in Luke 17, verse 28, he gave a similar teaching. This time he did not say as in the days of Noah. Luke 17, 28, Jesus said, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. Okay, so again there is sudden destruction. Verse 34 he says, In that night there will be two men in one bed, one taken, the other left. Two women grinding, verse 35, one taken, the other left. Two men in the field, one taken, the other left. So talking about sudden change. And some being taken, some being left. As in the days of Lot, as in the days of Noah. Now, a pre-tribulation of that, uh, explanation of that would be that God took away Noah before the flood came. And that Lot escaped out of Sodom before the fire fell. But let's look more exactly at what the scripture says. Okay, so that we'll get this in their correct balance. Okay. Let's look in Matthew 24 again. Okay, in our notes. Why don't, why don't we look at the notes also? Okay. Uh, number A, a pre-tribulation doctrine of the rapture suggests it is the righteous taken first in a pre-tribulation rapture while the wicked remain to suffer in tribulation. Okay, number B, post-tribulation doctrine. Do we all see this on page five? Okay, post-tribulation doctrine says it is the wicked who are taken first when Christ returns in flaming fire to destroy the wicked. So let's look in 2 Thessalonians 1. Second Thessalonians 1, let's start reading in verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who now trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us, when will the Christian's rest come? He says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who know not God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all who believe. So this is talking about there being tribulation for the righteous until the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven to destroy the wicked. So the Christians are being persecuted. There's tribulation until the Lord comes to judge and destroy the wicked. So the ones that are suddenly taken away are the wicked when the Lord returns in flaming fire. Now, let's look in Matthew 13. Jesus talked about the last days in his parables there. In Matthew 13, let's look at verse 30, talking about the parable of the wheat and the tares. They said, let them both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. 
Jesus said, first, gather together the tares. Now, do we all remember what the tares represent? The tares are the wicked, the sons of the devil. Okay? And he said, first, gather together the tares to burn them. And then he says, and gather the wheat into my barn. Here it's talking about first gathering the wicked for destruction and burning. It's not talking about first gathering the righteous and then letting the unjust be punished for three and a half years or seven years before they are cast into fire. First, the wicked are gathered, cast into the fire. That's Christ returning in flaming fire and the wicked cast into hellfire. And then the righteous are gathered. Let's also look in verse 40 and onward here, Matthew 13, verse 40. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine as the sun in the kingdom of their father. So the ones that are gathered and removed and thrown in the fire are the wicked and the ones that remain are the righteous. Okay? So is it the righteous taken away in a sudden rapture? Or is it the wicked who are taken away in judgment and fire when Christ returns? Here, Jesus is teaching first it is the tares that is the wicked gathered together and thrown in the fire then the righteous remain and shine in their father's kingdom here on earth now let's look back in Matthew 24 as in the days of Noah let's start reading in verse 37 Matthew 24 37 but as the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. Who did the flood take away? The wicked. And who were the ones that remained? The righteous. Noah and his family. It does not say that the righteous were taken away in a rapture. No, it says the wicked were taken away. And he says, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two women at the mill, one taken, the other left. He's saying the wicked were taken in Noah's day at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men, the wicked will be taken. Two women, the women, the wicked will be taken. He is paralleling that the days of Noah... The wicked were taken away and destroyed. In the days of the coming of the Son of Man, it will be the same. So it does not say that Noah and his family were secretly raptured and kept from trouble. No, they went through the trouble of that day, but they were protected in the ark. Just like the Israelites, they went through the judgments, the ten plagues. Jesus did not take them out of Egypt before judgment fell. No, he protected them in Egypt while the judgments were all around. We read that earlier. Now, how about the days of Lot? Well, we better turn back in Genesis about that. Was Lot taken away from the trouble before it fell? Genesis 19. Starting in verse 15. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot and said, Rise, take your wife and daughters, and leave before you are consumed in the judgment of the city. And while he lingered, the angels took hold of their hands and brought them out of the city. Genesis 19:17. And when they had brought them out, the angels said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Run to the mountains. Did Lot run to the mountains? Verse 18, Lot said, Please know, my Lord, if your servant has found favor, please, I cannot escape to the mountains. Verse 20, See this city near here. It is a little one. 
please, can I not escape there? And my soul will live, find protection. So the angel said, verse 21, See, I have favored you, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Lot did not have enough righteous influence to protect Sodom, but he ran outside of Sodom just to a little city. And God allowed him to stay there and said, I will not destroy the little city for your sake. You don't have to run to the mountains. You can stay here in the plain. And then it says, verse 23, When the sun had risen on the earth, when Lot entered Zor, the little city, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah out of the heavens and overthrew those cities, all the plain and all the inhabitants, except for the little town of Zor. Zor was one of the cities in the plain. All the others were destroyed in the fire. But Lot remained. He didn't go to the mountains. He was there in the middle of it, but God protected him. Read the story, okay? Read the story, and you'll see what this says. I hope you understand it easily, okay? It's saying Lot was not taken away up to the mountains, raptured before the fire came. No, he was there in one of the cities of the plain, but a little one that he was given permission to hide in. And all the other cities were burned up in fire. The wicked were taken away. And it was the righteous who remained. Okay? Now let's also consider if one is taken and the other remains, if it's the wicked that are suddenly taken in judgment, then that would also parallel with something else Jesus taught. Jesus talked about that he would come back as a thief in the night. Now, if you saw the old movie back from the 1970s, there was a secret rapture, and boom, like a thief in the night, all the Christians disappeared. And then the Antichrist came and brought all trouble in the world. Is that what Jesus meant when he said that he would come like a thief in the night? Okay. Well, there are two possible ways someone can come like a thief. Either they can come secretly or they can come unexpectedly at a time they were not expected. Okay. Now, did Jesus say he would come as a thief in the night by it being a secret event? Or did he mean he would come as a thief in the night that it would be unexpected? People would not expect him to come. Okay? So this is important for us to understand. Now, let's look in 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 10 says, The Lord is not slack about his promises, as some count slackness or slowness, but he is long-suffering to us, not willing any should perish. Verse 10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. The Lord is coming back in flaming fire. But if there's a great noise and fervent heat, is that a secret event? Or is that a sudden, unexpected event? Okay. Let's look also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. Let your fingers walk fast through the scripture pages. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul wrote, Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Okay, so Jesus is coming as a thief. Is he coming 
like a thief silently or is he coming like a thief unexpectedly okay a thief could be noisy if he's got a gun he could come in shooting okay but what does Jesus say verse 3 when they say peace and safety then sudden destruction comes upon them so this is talking about it being unexpected sudden destruction comes when Christ comes as a thief in the night sudden destruction does it say Jesus is coming back as a thief in the night to silently rescue his people no it says he's coming back unexpectedly with sudden destruction not for the righteous but for the wicked and then he says and they shall not escape the end of verse 3 but verse 4 but you brethren are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as the thief verse 5 you are all sons of light sons of the day the sons of the day the sons of light the Christians will not have the day of Christ come as a thief it's to the wicked that Christ will unexpectedly come as a thief with sudden destruction but Paul said but you brethren are not in darkness so this day will not overtake you as a thief so he clearly says Christ is not coming back as a thief for you for the Christians Christ is coming back suddenly as a thief for the wicked to bring them sudden destruction and they shall not escape the end of verse 3 but for the Christians we're not in the night for Christ to come unexpectedly we are the children of light we live in the day we are expecting the coming of the Lord amen, amen. we are waiting for him to come and if we're all righteous we're waiting with joy with expectancy he's going to come back to make everything right to rule the world with righteousness to resurrect the dead Christians to to rapture and change in the twinkling of an eye the Christians that are alive and will be uh, changed in a moment given resurrection bodies to live with him forever in his kingdom we say come Lord Jesus but the wicked are not expecting him to come and for the wicked he will come like a thief in the night but it will be noisy great fiery heat destruction but unexpected to the wicked who laugh at the thought oh, there's no Jesus is coming again that's a fairy tale sudden destruction will come to the unprepared but if we are Christians sons of the light he said verse 5 we are not of the night or darkness verse 4 but you brethren are not in the darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief brethren live in the day the thief doesn't come in the day the thief comes in the night and will destroy the wicked so is that clear to everyone okay Paul said you brethren will not have the day of the Lord overtake you as a thief it's the wicked that will find him coming as a thief with destruction now also the scripture says that the backsliders will also unexpectedly find their Lord to return let's read Matthew 24 so the wicked aren't expecting it the backsliders also have forgotten about the Lord and are not expecting him to come suddenly with judgment so Matthew 24 let's start reading the story in verse 44 therefore be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect who then is a faithful and wise servant who his master will make ruler over his household to give him food in due season verse 46 blessed is that servant the faithful one when his master comes will find him doing well assuredly I say to you he will make him ruler over all his goods when the Lord suddenly comes 
he will reward and promote the righteous. But what about an evil servant? Verse 48. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. Jesus isn't coming back probably for another five centuries. You know, everybody's just saying, you know, these are the last days. Well, they've said that for 50 years and, you know, they're on. No. No, but if he says, my master is delaying his coming, he's not coming soon, and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that house will come on a day he is not looking for him, and an hour he is not aware of, and will cut him in two, and appoint him with the hypocrites. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there will be sudden judgment for the wicked and for the backsliders who are rejecting a coming of Christ. But if we are walking in the light, if we are Christians seeking to walk with Christ, Christ will come back to reward us, not bring judgment. Now, another area of scripture that again ties in with all of these other scriptures, all pointing at Uh, post-tribulation rapture of the church when Christ returns in power and glory. Number H in your notes, near the middle bottom of page 5. The church will be raptured to meet the Lord and escort Christ back to the earth at his triumphant return. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says, And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the resurrected dead, to meet the Lord in the air. That word meet, M-E-E-T, in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, okay, in the Greek the word is apentasis. And to meet someone like this, it is a word used to describe when a king or a great man comes to visit a city And he will be met outside of the gates of the city by the citizens to meet him. We would call it a welcoming committee. Okay? Welcome a great person that is arriving and escort him with honor into the city. Okay? This custom was carried out when Christ was given his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. They put the robes down on the ground and palm branches and and hosanna to the king. They went out of the city to welcome him, to meet him and welcome him. This was an apentasis, a welcoming committee. And that is what the Christians, the dead and living, will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord, to welcome him when he is coming back from heaven in great power and glory and in flaming fire for the wicked. Now, let's look at how this is also used in the scripture. In Acts chapter 28, which talks about after his long journey from Jerusalem, Paul is getting near Rome, where he was going to be for several years while his court case was going to be tried by the Roman Senate. And as they were getting near Rome, some of the Roman Christians had heard that the great apostle Paul was arriving. And some of them came out as a welcoming delegation or committee. And so in Acts 28, starting in verse 14, as they're coming up from southern Italy, it says, We found brethren and stayed with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard that we were coming, they came to meet us at Appi Forum and the three inns. Now those were two small towns south of Rome. Rome is on the long boot, we call it, of Italy. And as Paul was traveling up as a prisoner of Rome, when he got first to the town called Epiforum, that was 39 miles south of Rome. 
he got his first welcoming committee of Roman Christians that wanted to welcome the great Apostle Paul to the city. And then they got another nine miles to the three inns, a little town with three hotels, three inns. And there was another welcoming committee of Christians that had walked 30 miles. That's about 46, 47 kilometers just to welcome Paul as he was coming into Rome. And then they all continued on their walk back up to Rome. Now, if President-elect Duterte thought we found out he was going to come here to our gathering tonight, would Pastor Edwin just sit there? And would we all just sit in our seats? And would we all say... Oh, hi, President-elect. Oh, come on in. Yeah, we got some water. Come on in. No. It would be proper to be right down at the gate of the church, all of the pastors and elders, to very honorably welcome the coming of the President-elect. That's to meet the Lord. Okay, to be a welcoming committee to the one who is coming. You go out to meet him. And that, again, is used about the coming of Christ in the story of the parable of the ten virgins. Let's read in Matthew 25. Jesus talked about the ten virgins invited to the wedding, speaking about his second coming, and how five would be prepared and five unprepared. Okay, verse 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. It's the time of the wedding, the time of the second coming, when the bride of Christ will marry Christ, and so shall we ever be with him. And they lived happily ever after. Okay? But it says here that while the bridegroom delayed, they all slept. Verse 6. At midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him, to appentace in him. Go out to welcome him. And so the five virgins that, were, that had the oil and the light, they went out and met the bridegroom who was coming for the wedding. Okay? Now, the Jews' custom was that when... Uh, Young lady and young man got engaged. Then usually it was for an, a year and the young man would prepare maybe a, a home to live in or prepare, you know, fields, a farm, something to get ready for the wedding, have money for the feast and everything. It costs a lot of money for a wedding. And then after the year was up, then the bridegroom, the young man, would go to the town of, the, of his bride. And they would be expecting him for the bridal event. And as he was go going near, then the whole, bri the whole you know, party would go out to meet the groom as he came. So it wouldn't be, here comes the bride. No, it would be, here comes the groom. Okay? He lives over in Nevotis and he's walked all this way. And, you know, let's welcome him to the wedding party. The wedding would be held where the bride was. And even today in our cultures, we have the wedding where the bride lives. Okay? So, Jesus is coming for his bride, and right outside the door as he's coming, they say, go out and meet the bridegroom. Up and taste of him. Welcome him. That is what the church will do when the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive are caught up together, raptured together with them to meet the Lord, to welcome him when the King of Kings returns as the King and Judge of all the earth to destroy the wicked and let the righteous live in a world cleansed from sin and wicked people. So, the br bridegroom, or, or like when Paul went from 
Jerusalem to Rome. Okay? Paul traveled many months on several ships from Jerusalem over to Cy uh, Cyprus, Malta, traveled up southern Italy, and then, you know, 50 kilometers away from Rome, he meets some of the Roman citizens. When they meet there, then did Paul take the citizens and take them on the three-month journey all the way back to Jerusalem? No, Paul was going to Rome, and they met him outside and escorted him to Rome. A little out of the city, they met him, welcomed him to their home city. When Jesus comes from heaven all the way through the galaxies and universe down to the air, and he comes in the clouds, is he coming in the clouds to catch up his bride? and then take her away back to heaven? Okay, who is the welcoming party and who is the one that is coming? It doesn't say that Christ will come all the way to welcome the church. Christ comes and the church welcomes Jesus back to the earth at the second coming. Okay, then we will always be with the Lord but the marriage is where the bride is and the bride is on the earth making herself ready okay so can we see how these things all work together Paul went a long long distance to be welcomed outside Rome as he was coming Jesus will come a long long distance to be welcomed in the air and all the church glorious will return down from the clouds when Christ comes in great power and glory. His feet stand on the Mount of Olives. Flaming fire destroys the wicked armies that are conquering the Jews. He rescues the Jews. But they're on the earth fighting. The Christians are raptured to Apentasis, a welcoming committee to meet their Lord and come with him as king of kings this is very simple the second coming of Christ is not two comings there's not the first secret silent coming and then the public coming the second coming of Christ is one coming one event he's coming from heaven to the earth and as he comes near the Christians will be joined up with him and the saints from heaven they come in the white horses and the, their resurrected bodies join them, and they all come to the earth when Christ comes to rule the world. It's very simple. And all of the scriptures work together to teach this message. Now, when I was a young Christian, I was taught there would be a secret rapture of the Christians. And... So when I first started to study the scriptures and saw, but the raptured Christians in the first resurrection, they, some of them died because they would not take the mark of the beast. How could they be raptured before the Antichrist comes if the Antichrist kills them? Okay? When I started to see those things of two second comings did not line up and started to study the scriptures. Then I saw how simple the second coming of Christ is. One time, from heaven to the earth, as he is coming near, the Christians greet him from the earth. The saints from heaven come with him, the armies of heaven. They come to Jerusalem. Jesus destroys the wicked armies. He rescues the Jews, and the Christians will are resurrected, changed in a moment and they will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years now we have a lot of scriptures here I hope they will become simple to you but if you have heard other doctrines or other ways to put them together this might be hard for you to say well how does this all work what about this what about that study these scriptures see how they work together Christ is coming back with the sound of a great trumpet. 
It's the last trumpet, according to 1 Corinthians 15. But the last trumpet is in Revelation 11. After the first trumpet, there's the burning up of, you know, of the plants and the trees. Next trumpet burns up the rivers. Next trumpet, more judgments on the earth. After all those things is the last trumpet when the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of Christ and the dead are raised for the Christians to be rewarded. That's the first resurrection and that takes place after the whole church age including tribulation and when that happens Jesus will begin to rule the world cleansing the world in flaming fire and the Christians we will be with him to begin a new kingdom of peace now let's just very shortly look at a few scriptures here at the end of your notes bottom of page 5 Christ will return as king and judge of the world okay let's read in Revelation 19 about his second coming verse 11 now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war his eyes were like a flame of fire on his head were many crowns verse 13 had a clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God verse 14 the armies of heaven follow after follow with him on white horses verse 15 out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that he should strike the nations he will rule them with a rod of iron verse 16 he has a name on his thigh king of kings and lord of lords so this is speaking about the second coming of our lord jesus christ to rule the world and in our notes number a christ will reign over the world in the millennial kingdom age of a thousand years six times in revelation chapter 20 it says a thousand years a thousand years a thousand years so that is not sounding like a symbolic number although there are a lot of symbolic things in the book of revelation if you consider that human history according to the Bible is about 6,000 years to the second coming and then there will be a kingdom age of peace on the in the world that would correspond to a seventh day or the day of the Lord being is this thousand years a thousand year kingdom of peace when Christ returns that's also suggested by the prophetic typology of the Old Testament so a thousand it seems like it's a literal number for how long Christ will rule the world after his second coming and when he rules the world oh there's so many scriptures we've got them in your notes we don't have time for them all tonight okay let's look at a few though this is it's wonderful to see the kingdom that will come Zechariah chapter 14 okay it says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and he will destroy the armies that are fighting against Jerusalem. And it says, verse 9, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one and his name is one. Verse 16, It will come to pass of everyone left of all the nations, they came against Jerusalem. They will go up year to year to worship the king and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Every year the nations will send delegations to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles to worship Jesus in Jerusalem. And then it says uh, more about uh, verse 21. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holiness to the Lord. It's talking about peace and prosperity in this chapter after the Lord returns let's read in Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 speaking of the same time Micah chapter 4 it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills and peoples will flow into it 
many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law will go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's because Jesus will live in Jerusalem and will give the laws for the nations from there. Verse 3, he will judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They will beat their swords into plowshares. Their spears they will turn into pruning hooks. No more military equipment around the world. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. Verse 4, but everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. And no one will make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk in the, will walk in the name of his God. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever. Verse 6, in that day, says the Lord, when the Lord exalts Jerusalem and Christ is king there. I will assemble the lame, gather the outcast. I will make the lame a remnant, the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. O oh, you, and you, O oh, tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, to you it will come. Even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. King David ruled from Jerusalem over an empire stretching from Egypt to the Euphrates. But Jesus is going to rule over all the nations when he returns. But there's going to be peace, no wars, and most nations spend 10 or 15 percent of their national finances on their military. When Jesus returns, nations will not fight other nations. And they can take all of that money and instead use it to produce useful things. Plows, tractors, better homes. And there will be peace and prosperity when Christ rules the world and there is peace among the nations. Isaiah 24, verse 21. It shall come to pass in that day the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones. Okay? The exalted ones are the principalities and powers of Satan in the heavenlies. And then he says, And he will punish on earth the kings of the earth. Verse 22, They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit. They will be shut up in the prison. And after many days they will be punished. So it says that God is going to gather the, the, uh, the host on high, the heavenly powers of Satan and gathered into a pit that's spoken of in Revelation 20. An angel will come and take Satan, bind him, cast him into a pit for a thousand years before he will be judged at the end of the millennium. And here it says, they will be shut up in prison and after many days they will be punished. Then it says, verse 23, and the moon will be disgraced and be the sun ashamed. This is at the second coming when Christ comes in judgment on the wicked. And Satan. And then it says, For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously. Jesus will be a glorious king on Mount Zion in Jerusalem when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's so many more prophecies. I just encourage you to read them sometime when you have time, okay? Of how wonderful it will be when Jesus rules the world for a thousand years. Now, number two in our notes, the top of page six. The apostles, they knew the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah bringing his kingdom, and they were waiting for Jesus to start up his kingdom, okay? The mother of James and John came and said, Jesus, please do what I ask. And Jesus said, what do you ask? And their mother says, well, uh, when you sit on your throne in your kingdom, let one of my sons sit on a throne on your right hand and your, my other son on your left hand. Give him a throne too. They knew there would be thrones. They knew they would sit on them. Why did they know that? Let's read Matthew chapter 19.
Jesus talked about the rewards of the righteous. And Matthew 19, 27, Peter answered and said to Christ, See, we have left all and followed you. What will we have? What will be our reward? So Jesus said to them, verse 28, Assuredly, I say to you, in the regeneration, that's the resurrection, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus promised his twelve disciples they would each get a throne in the resurrection. Now, we know Judas Iscariot disqualified himself because of sin, and in Acts chapter 1, they replaced him with a disciple that had followed since the days of John the Baptist. His name was Matthias. He replaced Judas, but those 12 apostles will be given 12 thrones to rule the 12 tribes, or we could say the 12 provinces of Israel. So they knew a kingdom was coming, that there would be thrones available for the faithful. And let's read in Matthew 20. When Jesus came into Jerusalem for the last time, they knew uh, that things would be different. Uh, no, excuse me, let's look in... Maybe it's Matthew 25. There's a number of parables here. Excuse me. Okay, no, that's parable of the sheep and goats we were going to get to. Let's read Luke 19. Let's see if that's the right one. Luke 19. Verse 11. Now, when they heard these things, Jesus spoke a parable because he was near Jerusalem and his disciples thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to die. He was talking different. The disciples knew there was a big change that was coming and they hoped the kingdom of God might come now. We might have our thrones. So Jesus had to tell them a story, verse 12. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom and later return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them each a minus, you know, a sum of money and said, Do business. Use what I have given you till I come. Okay, verse 15, when he had returned, he called his servants and found out how much they had gained. Verse 16, the first came and said, Lord, your mina, I have earned ten. Verse 17, and he said to them, Well done, good servant. You were faithful with a little. I will give you, not ten minas, I will give you ten cities. When Jesus comes back with his kingdom. And the second came, Master, I earned five minas. Verse 19, and he said to him, You will rule over five cities. Now Jesus will be the king of all the kings. But you don't just have a king ruling a nation and no other levels of government. Can one king make all the laws and regulate all of the problems of a country? No, he needs governors, mayors, you know, all kinds of levels you have in the Philippines. The president, the senate, and the supreme court. You have the governors, you have the mayors, you have the barangay officials down to the, you know, uh, Tanod and the different situs. Uh, you have many levels of government. But Jesus will be the king of all the kings. The resurrected saints, some might qualify to be a king of a nation. The Old Testament scriptures say David will be raised from the dead to be the king of the Jews. That's who will get that job in the millennium, according to Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Jesus said to his 12 apostles, you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes, the 12 provinces of Israel. They would be governors. Jesus said that after he goes to a far country and returns, he will make some of his faithful servants mayors over cities. International ruler of the world, national kings, provincial governors, mayors of cities, and all the levels of government that will be needed 
for a good kingdom to run. All the way down to what? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us anything less, except when God told Adam and Eve that they were going to multiply and rule the world, he didn't give them thrones. They weren't ready for that yet. What did he give them? A garden to take care of. The first simple lessons before Adam and Eve could learn to rule the world was they had to learn to take care of a garden. So what might be the lowest level of rulership in the millennium? It might be you'll have a Wally's ting ting and you'll be you'll be cleaning, sweeping the leaves of the garden and cutting the trees and keeping everything beautiful in the garden you were assigned to. You won't rule a nation. You'll rule over the weeds. Okay? <laughs> that might be the lowest level of ruling in the millennium. Ruling over a garden. But that's just a guess, okay? Some of the things we're discussing are not absolutely clear in Scripture. We're just giving you ideas that, that seem like they can uh, help us to get a bigger picture. What we do know is some Christians will be mayors, governors, will be kings. And so we want to be those that have a vision, that we want to ex be excellent Christians, fully faithful to the Lord, that when he comes, we will not be unexpectedly surprised because we were getting drunk and doing evil things and we weren't even thinking about God anymore. And when he comes, he's going to come back to judge us. No, we don't want to be like that. We want to be faithful Christians serving the Lord using what he's given us to make more. He gives us one amount of money. Let's make it five times, ten times as much. And if we learn how to be faithful and productive in little things now, Jesus will give great promotion and reward at his second coming. Let's read in Matthew chapter 24. Excuse me, Matthew 25, okay, verse 20, He who received five talents said, Lord, I have gained five more talents. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. When he returns, and we will all give an account of whether we were faithful and fruitful in our life to serve God. If we're faithful with a little, God may give us great promotion in the coming kingdom. Okay? So we want to be those that are called, chosen, and faithful in this life. We want to be those that help complete the great commission and prepare the way for our king to return. We don't want to be weak Christians that can't uh, stand for righteousness. We should not think that Christianity means if you're a Christian, life will all be good and you'll be wealthy and you know you can do everything you want, sin all you want, because you're a Christian, you're under grace. No, we want to be pressing on toward the mark of the high call of God. We want to be preparing for without holiness, no man will see the Lord. We want, if we're given one talent, to make five talents or ten talents out of it so that in the day of Christ's return, he might say, Brother Eddie, you were faithful with your little church. Now I'm going to make you the Barangay captain there in your section of, Mer of Makati for a thousand years. You'll have 70,000 people. A little better than, you know, the 200 you had in your church when I returned. That will be the time he will give promotions when he establishes his kingdom in the earth. And we are the ones that want to be faithful now and preparing 
that we will be able to serve God and love Him even more in His coming kingdom. Do we understand these basic things? We don't understand all the little things, but we want to understand the important view of what is ahead. There will be trouble. Some Christians will die. But whether we live triumphantly through the last days or we die triumphantly in the last days, that's up to God. If we follow God fully, we will gain His pleasure and His rewards when He returns and establishes His kingdom.